been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. I think we're going to get started. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Corman. I am the chair of the Montgomery County House uh, delegation. Welcome to our annual uh, Maryland Department of Transportation Consolidated Transportation Program uh, presentation and show. We're really pleased to be joined by uh, the Secretary of Transportation and all his modal or business unit heads to talk about what's in their uh, uh, new six-year uh, consolidated transportation program plan. And I know uh, there's a lot of um, really hot-button issues that we're all interested in um, that are reflected in the uh, county's priorities letter to, to you, Mr. Secretary, and are in your CTP. Um, chief among them, the Quarter Cities Transit Way. Um, I guess it was on page A5 of the CTP. Maybe we could talk more about that. Uh, WMATA, very interested in hearing about how it's going with your new role, role on the board. Um, obviously, that's on page one of the county's priority letter. Uh, really exciting um, Georgia Avenue uh, project to try to redevelop that area to make it better for bikers, pedestrians, and uh, traffic. It's on uh, page SHA M11 of the CTP. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of interest in um, the public-private partnership being proposed for 495 and, and uh, 270. Um, a lot of interest in the Purple Line, Mr. Administrator, uh, which is also page one of the county's priority letter. And then some general issues that I know we're all interested in, like Vision Zero, uh, Real ID. Uh, and because the Comptroller is a Montgomery County resident, I should also mention the Bay Bridge to make sure you uh, have that covered as well. Um, so we're eager to hear from you. Uh, after we uh, hear from the Senate uh, chair of the delegation, we'll go to you, Mr. Secretary, and your modal heads for your presentation, and then we'll start bringing up panels of local and state elected officials. And we'll just ask the folks coming up um, to keep their comments to two or three minutes each so that we can allow these folks to answer the questions and then um, get, uh, get on with their evening. So with that, let me turn it over to my uh, colleague, Senator Zucker. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first, I thought everyone was out here to see uh, Delegate Corman and I chair our first transportation uh, meeting, but, uh, but I know that it uh, reflects the uh, priorities of Montgomery County to make sure that our transportation infrastructure is kept up to par 
and that we're getting the resources we need. Uh, we're very interested in hearing from the administration as well as those folks that have come out today to express uh, their thoughts on the future of transportation uh, priorities in, in our county. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Secretary. I'd like to hear what you and, and your administration is doing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman Zucker and Mr. Chairman Corman. And good evening to everyone. My name is Pete Ron, and I am the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. And thank you for inviting us here this evening to be able to present on our Consolidated Transportation Program, which covers fiscal years 2020 to 2025. Uh, Carrie Snyder has copies of the CTP, big book here at the back. Anyone who would like a copy of it, just raise your hand. She will bring one to you. I see a hand up front, several people around, and we'll get one to you. So I would like to introduce the MDOT team that is here today. And uh, frankly, we have some real superstars within MDOT today that are working to deliver uh, very difficult projects to uh, to Maryland, and I want to start with MDOT MVA Administrator Chrissy Neiser, Chrissy, MDOT MTA Administrator Kevin Quinn, MDOT SHA Administrator Greg Snyder, Slater. <laughs> <laughs> what the? I don't work with you all that much. I confuse your name all the time. Um, from the Maryland Aviation Administration, MDOT MAA Administrator Ricky Smith. From the Maryland Transportation Authority, uh, we have Melissa Williams. Uh, we also have with us District 3's District Engineer, the absolutely amazing Andre Cottrell. Andre, raise your hand. From the Secretary's Office, I've already introduced our Regional Planner, Carrie Snyder. Uh, and we have our state legislative officer, Pilar Helm. Where is Pilar? Somewhere? Ah, back here in the back. And so I, I have to tell you, the, this team is amazing and it is an award winning team. And having won awards across every phase of transportation industries, together, our units have earned nearly 300 awards since 2015 and more than 50 already this year. They range from design and engineering awards to accolades for safety, security, and excellence in customer service. I am proud of our team and I am proud of what these awards mean. They mean that we are working to meet the transportation needs of Marylanders and connect them to life's opportunities. So I can tell you it's nice to be back in Rockville uh, we had a great meeting with Montgomery County officials over the summer at the Maryland Association of County Conference in Ocean City. At MACO, uh, you asked MDOT SHA to consider implementation of all pedestrian phase at the intersection of Maryland 97 and Forest Glen Road, and I can report that we are conducting a traffic study to analyze that request. The report should be available by the end of this month. I know uh, we share the mission to promote and facilitate pedestrian safety, and it's a critical element of community life and something our residents should expect. In a four minutes, a few minutes, Administrator Slater will discuss a pedestrian safety program we've launched in several business districts here in Montgomery County, also in Prince George's County. Um, it's a tremendous, important effort and represents one way that we, working together, can make a difference in the lives of individuals and families. I believe uh, two other projects we've worked on, the Purple Line and the I-495 and I-270 Public-Private Partnership proposal can also improve the quality of life for hundreds of thousands of residents while easing some of the worst traffic congestion in the nation. I'd like to thank Montgomery County for participating in our transit work group which uh, formed in conjunction with the I-495 and I-270 P3 program. This group is exploring ways that transit can benefit from and complement opportunities that the traffic relief plan will represent. As you know, the $5.6 billion Purple Line will begin operations by the end of 2022. 
with connections including Bethesda, Silver Springs, and others. Administrators Slater and Quinn will provide updates on both these P3 projects. I'm going to steal a small bit of Kevin's thunder by noting that the Purple Line is already generating $2 billion in investments along the corridor and will create some 6,300 jobs overall. The P3 project is critical for these projects allowing us to deliver congestion relief without significant new state dollars. And that's huge because it lets us invest in other projects of need here in Montgomery County and across Maryland. I also want to mention something that's an offshoot of these projects, and that's Opportunity MDOT. Opportunity MDOT is our initiative to enlist and encourage local, small, minority-owned and disadvantaged businesses to be a part of the bidding network for the I-495 and I-270 P3 program and other MDOT projects. Recruitment, workforce development, and training are components of Opportunity MDOT, and we launched Opportunity MDOT in August at the University of Maryland College Park, and the event drew interest from hundreds of business representatives. I'm excited about this as we improve Maryland's transportation network and the lives of those who use it. Opportunity MDOT can help us change the trajectory of local firms and of local families. You know, MDOT's mission is to create a safe, reliable, and balanced transportation network that can help residents and businesses thrive. Thanks to the support of Governor Hogan, that's exactly what we are doing. For the CTP covering fiscal years 2020 to 2025, the Hogan administration will invest $15.3 billion in Maryland's transportation network. In addition, the Maryland Transportation Authority is investing $3.1 billion in our toll roads and bridges. This CTP is $1.1 billion less than last year's final six-year CTP. The reduction is due to declining revenue projections, increasing operating transit costs for MTA and WMATA, and delivering a record construction program in record time, resulting in completed projects being removed from the CTP. The good news for you is that Governor Hogan signed bipartisan legislation last year that increases the funding formula for highway user revenues going to local jurisdictions from 9.6% to 13.5% through fiscal 2024. After years of fighting to increase the formula and adding annual grants instead, the Hogan administration is now providing a predictable revenue stream you can rely on to fund your local transportation projects. This year, Montgomery County and its communities will receive $14.38 million in highway user revenues. That's an increase of nearly $1.6 million over last year. MDOT's overall revenues are not increasing as much as we had previously estimated. MTA revenues and gas tax revenues are down due to fewer people using transit and gas stations selling fewer gallons at lower than projected gas prices. It's worth noting that while the amount of gallons of gas sold has gone down, the annual vehicle miles traveled has gone up. As more people choose cleaner, more efficient cars, this is a trend we expect to continue. Since fiscal 2015, annual vehicle miles traveled increased by nearly 3.5 billion miles, up to 60.8 billion miles traveled in Maryland. Another factor reducing our available capital funding is the rising operating costs for MTA and WMATA. While 8.5% of commuters use transit, 42% of our six-year budget goes to transit, and that number is rising each year, including the fact that 3% of our revenues come from transit. The state will provide WMATA with $805 million in operating and capital funds in fiscal 2020. 
This six-year CTP includes $4.9 billion in WMATA funding. In fiscal year 2022, Maryland's annual investment in WMATA will be larger than its investment in the State Highway Administration. Still, MDOT is making the most of every dollar and is delivering once-in-a-generation projects on an accelerated timeline. <coughs> In 2015, the Hogan administration outlined a program of historic infrastructure investment. Over the past four years, MDOT has completed 1,069 projects worth nearly $5.9 billion. We're continuing this investment. We have 718 projects currently underway totaling $7.2 billion. These investments will improve our transportation network. While major projects garner most of the attention, preservation is equally important. MDOT SHA has reached a milestone treating more than half of all lane miles on SHA roads, 10,943 miles. Governor Hogan also has made record investments in transit. We're happy to support local options and connect residents to jobs, recreation, health services, and other opportunities. The Hogan administration has been able to save Marylanders money and still invest in infrastructure, such as the $1.1 billion extension of I-95 express toll lanes to Harford County. Those I-95 express lanes give us a great example of what managed lanes can do which of course are a part of the I-495, I-270, P-3 proposal uh, and what can be accomplished. On I-95, they have given commuters a real option and have benefited all users of this busy artery. Even in the free general use lanes, we've seen a 12% time savings for drivers since the express lanes were installed. On another topic, I'm sure you and many of your constituents are aware of the critical $27 million rehabilitation project that we are conducting on the westbound Bay Bridge span. It's a project that must be done. This week, MDTA and Governor Hogan announced some steps that will help complete it as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the Bay Crossing Study team has identified the preliminary cor corridor alternatives retained for analysis as part of the Tier 1 NEPA study. Three corridors, as well as a no-build alternative, will face additional study as part of the Tier 1 NEPA process. More information is available at baycrossingstudy.com. MDTA's toll modernization plan is another initiative affecting all Marylanders. In July, the governor announced that this plan will save Marylanders more than $28 million over five years. This would be the third round of toll relief during the Hogan administration, resulting in up to $344 million in savings. And I'm sure you've heard that the key bridge in Baltimore and the Hatem Bridge on the Harford and Cecil County line are now cashless, uh, just like the intercounty connector here in Montgomery County with motorists paying tolls via Easy Pass or video tolling. Cashless tolling results in less congestion, better fuel efficiency, and reduced vehicle emissions. It also improves driver safety and gives us a safer work environment for our employees. We're looking at cashless tolls in another, in other places, as you may know, Governor Hogan has directed us to expedite full-time cashless tolling at the Bay Bridge in conjunction with the DEC project. Elsewhere around the state, we've heard good news on a project that affects all of Maryland, and that is approval of $125 million in federal funds for the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore. This project will allow us to double stack containers from the Port of Baltimore, and this will ease truck traffic boost our economy and create jobs. The Port of Baltimore is the number one port in America for automobiles and roll-on, roll-off machinery, and we are coming off of our best year ever 
for general cargo at the state-owned marine terminals, which is 11 million tons in fiscal 2019. Another place we're setting records is the BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport, an economic engine for all of Maryland. BWI continues to be recognized by industry and consumer groups for excellent service and passenger amenities. A year ago, Condé Nast Traveler Magazine ranked BWI the 10th best airport in the United States. In 2018, 27.1 million passengers came through BWI, which is a new record in which by far exceeds the usage of Reagan National or Dulles International. I have to throw that in, even though it's not in my remarks. BWI is the busiest airport in the region, and it produces an annual economic impact of $9.3 billion and supports 106,000 jobs. And it's easy to lead into the next topic, which is if you are heading to the airport, whether BWI or any other, I encourage you to check your status with Real ID. The federal law passed in 2005 after the tragic 9-11 terrorist attacks. The deadline is October 1st of next year. Our MDOT Motor Vehicle Administration is doing a fantastic job getting Marylanders ready. And in fact, Maryland was the first state in the nation to be recertified by the Department of Homeland Security for Real ID compliance. Administrator Neiser will talk more about Real ID in just a bit. And by the way, I have to tell you how proud I am that customer satisfaction ratings at MDOT MVA for staff professionalism, friendliness, and helpfulness remains above 98%. I will put that up against any MVA in the country and a lot of other departments as well. We are expanding on that with Customer Connect, which is a system that will change the way MDOT MVA does business. Customer Connect will allow us to deliver more services online and complete transactions more efficiently and accurately. We will launch in May of 2020 with certain vehicle services and business licensing. And MDOT is also committed to a multimodal approach to transportation, and that includes commuter choice, which promotes alternatives to driving alone to work, such as public transportation, ride sharing, biking, walking, teleworking, and flexible work schedules. Through the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit, businesses can qualify for a tax credit of up to $100 per employee and the Guaranteed Ride Home program can make sure commuters have free emergency rides when needed. Evidence shows that employers who offer commuter benefits and flexibility attract and retain top talent. Go to commuterchoicemaryland.com for more information. So I'm going to turn this over in just a moment to our administrators. But I want to thank you again for hosting us today. I appreciate the guidance and dialogue that Montgomery County has provided to us as we work through some of the biggest transportation challenges in the nation. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Now I will ask our MDOT representatives to update you on the projects uh, in your county. And I will start with MDOT SHA, Greg Slater or Snyder, whichever you <laughs> prefer. Thank you, Pete. Great to be here in Montgomery County. I've been here a few times over the last few days, so I've been back and forth a lot. Before I provide some project updates, I want to notice some. I want to note something that concerns all of us at MDOT: the fact that there were more than 500 fatalities on Maryland roadways last year, and of those, 25 percent were pedestrians. We're tackling this issue differently than we have in the past, and recognizing that there is no one-size-fits-all formula. For transportation, we are introducing new tools for our engineers. MDOT SHA is releasing the draft 
of our context-driven access and mobility for all users guidance document. This is a new set of tools for engineers. This is a land use based guide that enables flexibility in design solutions to address major issues of safety and accessibility for pedestrians and non-motorized users. Along with best practices and design tools, this context guide provides a process to balance Maryland's transportation system with accessibility, mobility, and safety needs in each of the individual communities. I talked a little bit about this last week at the Uptown, Up County Transportation Town Hall meeting in Germantown. It was a great event and I was excited to the positive feedback that we received on that guide in its initial look. I brought a few copies here today. I think there are some around the back as well. I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on that as we go through this process. This guide significant, signifies a major shift in how our practitioners and partners approach roadway design, but just as important, we need to put it into action, which is why M.SHA is already implementing pedestrian safety focused improvements, starting in the business districts with dense populations and multimodal needs, a lot of dynamics. This effort includes uh, installation of traffic calming measures, central business district reducing speeds, and conducting uh, and constructing higher visibility crosswalks in all of those locations. We've looked at a number of corridors initially in Montgomery County and reduced the speed limits on several routes, including Maryland 190 and River Road, Maryland 187 George, Old Georgetown Road, and Maryland 97 and Georgia Avenue. We'll continue to evaluate these corridors and implement them one by one. As you know, uh, getting away from uh, some of these urbanized corridors uh, into our P3 program. Uh, our P3 program is designed to relieve congestion on 495 and 270. It's in the middle of the managed lane study in accordance with the National Environmental Policy Act. This month, MDOT will hold several workshops that will focus on the pre-NEPA activities for the second study that is between 370 and I-70 up towards Frederick. As Secretary Ron noted, we continue to work with our transit partners to discuss ways the P3 will benefit and enhance transit through a connected network. We are continuing community outreach. In addition to the workshops this past spring, we've met with more than 50 community groups and attended pop-up events to talk with residents and answer questions. We are continuing these efforts, so please let uh, your communities and your constituents know that we're available to come visit if you have an interest. And now I'd like to update you on some of the specific projects that we have going on around Montgomery County. We're happy to announce that work is continuing on the $7.2 million seminary road bridge over 495 and the $1.9 million resurfacing on US 29 between Maryland 384 and St. Andrews Way. Work is continuing on the innovative congestion management project uh, in Montgomery and Frederick County. This is a $131 million project to reduce time spent in traffic for commuters along 270 the road, through roadway and technological improvements. Construction is complete at six of 14 locations at Maryland 80, Maryland 109, the 370 interchange, the local lanes at Shady Grove and Falls Road, the I-270-495 split, and the express lanes from Democracy Boulevard to Montrose Road. We've heard concerns about removing the loop ramp at Shady Grove Road, and our design build team is studying the alternative solutions there. The team will provide us the result of those in that analysis uh, later on, and we will continue to partner with Montgomery County on that. Also on 270, construction continues at the Watkins Mill Road interchange in Gaithersburg. This is a $121 million project that will carry Watkins Mill Road over 270 and bridge the existing divide between the residents and commerce in the heart of Gaithersburg. That would take tremendous pressure off some of the surrounding interchanges. The new Watkins Mill interchange has reached 80% mark of completion and is expected to open to traffic next summer. M.SHA is also making progress on the $44 million project to realign Maryland 97 around Brookville. We would like to thank the county for the $10 million contribution on that project, and this project will reduce congestion in the town and improve traffic operations along that roadway. It's expected to be complete in the fall of 2021. We also continue on Maryland 355 at West Old Baltimore Road. Construction began in the spring and will be complete by the end of 2020. Again, we thank the county for their contribution and partnership on that successful project. Also on Maryland uh, 355, construction continues on the bridge over Little Bennett Creek. 
This summer, we opened the temporary bypass road. Construction of the $10 million bridge project is expected to be complete in the fall of 2020. MDOT SHA is also working with our state, county, and local partners uh, here in Montgomery County to deliver important bike and pedestrian projects using transportation alternatives, recreational trails, and our bikeways programs. Currently, we are partnering on 18 projects totaling $12.1 million in grants, three projects totaling $800,000 in state grants. These include the North Branch Hiker Biker Trail, the Ethan Allen Gateway Streetscape, the Tacoma Park Lincoln Avenue Safe Routes to School Project, and I'm also happy to announce several additional grants. $1.23 million for the design of the Falls Road Shared Use Path, another $1.2 million for rehabilitation of 12 miles of the CNO Towpath, $280,000 for the design of the North Stone Street Avenue Street and Sidewalk Improvements, $235,000 for the design of the New Hampshire Avenue Bikeway, $50,000 for parking, ADA, and uh, restroom upgrades at the Audubon Naturalist uh, Society Nature Trail, and $86,000 for educational programming for bike and pedestrian programs in Tacoma Park Schools. So that's a summary uh, of what we have going on at State Highway in this region. And at this point, I'll turn it over to MVA Administrator Neiser. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be in Montgomery County again. And at MDOT MBA, we're squarely focused on making sure our Marylanders are ready for the federal real ID requirements. That's the legislation that was put in place after the tragic events of 9-11 to require individuals to present proof of age and identity, social security, and two forms of Maryland residency. As of October 1 of 2020, all Americans will be required to present a real ID compliant driver's license or ID card in order to board an airplane or enter a federal building or have an alternative form of identification. So that could be a US passport, for instance. And so we're making sure that all of our residents are aware of those requirements and have a convenient way to fulfill them. When customers visit one of our 24 branch office, we're encouraging them to make an appointment. With an appointment, we're guaranteeing that we'll see them within 15 minutes. And so trying to get them in and out quickly and get that requirement taken care of. It has been very popular with customers since January. We've seen um, over 418,000 customers who had an appointment for their driver's license or ID card services. The vast majority of those are for real ID. To date, we've got 2.45 million Marylanders who are real ID ready, meaning they've submitted the required documents and they have the um, real ID driver's license or ID card with a star on it. Here in Montgomery County, 54% of our residents are real ID ready. To give customers the premier experience, we're making adjustments um, to make our hours more convenient. So we've permanently extended hours on Thursdays until 6.30, and that's at every one of our branch office. Uh, the other thing that we're doing at, at a few of our branch offices is uh, extending hours on Saturday, and that includes our Walnut Hill location here in Montgomery County. So certainly encourage residents to take advantage of those new convenient times that uh, we're trying to make available so that they can get that process done. We also feel like it's important for us to go out to the community and talk in person about Real ID and those requirements. So we've been all around Montgomery County at the Gaithersburg Summerfest, Montgomery County Fair, Twin Book Library, and Silver Springs National Night Out. I do want to emphasize if there's any events that you'd like us to come to, we're happy to come out in the community. Um, you can reach out to me directly or there's a place right on our website that you can request us to come to an event. I would ask to encourage all of our residents to check our MBA lookup tool. That'll tell you whether or not you're Real ID compliant. All you need to know is your driver's license or ID card number right on the face of your card. And that'll tell you whether or not you're Real ID compliant. If you're not compliant, it'll walk you through that step, steps of what documents are needed and then allow you to make an appointment uh, to get that taken care of. In addition to customer service, we're equally focused on safety, and we work very closely with federal, state, and local partners to develop solutions to help save lives on Maryland roadways. As Greg talked about, we lost, unfortunately, 513 individuals on our roadways. We all share the view that that's unacceptable, and we need to do all we can to prevent impaired, distracted driving and speeding and encourage safe behaviors like buckling up and, smart, uh, and walking smart statewide. Um, here in Montgomery County, uh, you experience 34 fatalities and, uh, as Greg mentioned, the high number being pedestrian. 
And so we're continuing to work together to see how we can drive down those numbers. We certainly congratulate Montgomery County in terms of the leadership with Vision Zero being first jurisdiction in Maryland to develop that plan. And as was mentioned earlier, we are, as of October 1, a Vision Zero state, which was developed or uh, adopted by the legislature, which means our goal is to completely eliminate fatalities by 2030. And so we're pleased to continue to work um, on our own plan as well as with Montgomery County. And we appreciate the leadership of uh, the local and state elected officials in that effort. We want to continue to really focus on what is causing the crashes. And one thing I always like to point out, because it's such a simple thing we can all do, is buckling up seatbelts. Here in Montgomery County, the observed seatbelt rate was actually under 92%. So, you know, it really only takes a second, and unfortunately, it's one of the primary causes of fatalities that we see on our roadway every year. So, um, especially in the backseat, people are just still not buckling up at a high rate, and so it's something appreciate to remind everybody about and uh, encourage individuals when you are the driver to make sure they're taking that safe behavior. In September, Governor Hogan announced 285,000 in highway safety grant funding for Montgomery County. Uh, that'll help programs at the county level as well as in Gaithersburg and Rockwell. Rockville. Uh, last week, we also joined with our federal and regional partners to announce the fall Street Smart campaign. Uh, this year, it's called Shattered Lives and, and shows the impact that a crash can have on a person's life, family, friends, and community. Working together at that federal, state, and local level, we believe we will reach that goal of zero fatalities. And we're also looking at not only behavioral aspect of things, we're also looking at how technology can deliver safety on our roadways. At this summer's MAKO conference, we debuted a new technology called the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety. This technology has the ability to detect alcohol on the driver's breath and to not allow the vehicle to start if it's above 0.08. It actually can be programmed that to zero if it's an underage driver. Um, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that we could save 60% of our impaired driving fatalities if that technology was in all vehicles. So Maryland is the first state in the country to use this on our fleet vehicles to test the technology. This will give manufacturers data in terms of the reliability of the sensors and the ability to be used going forward. The goal is to hopefully within the next several years have this as an option on new vehicle purchases. So just as you can now purchase other safety features, this could potentially be a feature that you could purchase on your own vehicle. So we're excited about the ability to drive down those impaired driving crashes. As Secretary Ron mentioned, um, we are looking forward to our rollout of our new IT modernization system called Customer Connect. That'll change the way we do business and help us serve customers even better to meet that vision of premier customer service. Today, um, not all transactions are available online, and that's something that we want to increase the availability and the convenience of those services. It will be deployed May 26 of 2020, so we're going to work very closely with customers to make sure they're aware aware of that deadline and take action, any transactions that you have around that time, make sure there's awareness there. We're constantly striving to improve our processes and um, use feedback from customers in terms in, in order to make things better. I'm really proud of our customer agents statewide. As the Secretary said, they continue to get that 98% customer satisfaction. I'd put that up against private industry, not just government. Um, they, you know, We know that with Real ID, we have a lot of customers coming through the door. They might not always be happy to be there. It's a federal requirement that we have to do, but the agents continue to deliver that premier customer service and I'm really proud of the job that they're doing. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end, and now I'll turn it over to Kevin Quim, uh, MDOT MTA Administrator. Okay. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, good evening. Thanks so much for having us here tonight. My name is Kevin Quinn. I'm the Administrator of the MDOT MTA, and really excited to talk about uh, some of the great investments we have going on in transit in Montgomery County. Uh, first, I just want to start off by thanking uh, the county for their continued support uh, and contributions to the Purple Line project. Montgomery County pledged $210 million in funding and other contributions to this vital 16.2-mile light rail line from Bethesda to New Carrollton. As you can see, the work has started in earnest, and we're now more than 20% complete with that project. We have more than 800 workers on the project, and 12 of the alignment's 16 miles are under active construction at this time. And soon, 
As early as January or February, we expect to lift massive steel girders into place that will support the tracks over the Silver Spring Transit Center. We'll also uh, be doing advanced construction on the elevated Riverdale Park Station, and I'm sure many of your constituents will be happy as we emerge from the grueling utility construction phase. Track placement is underway near New Carrollton, and before we know it, we'll be testing trains on those tracks as we move toward the start of operations by the end of 2022. And when finished, the Purple Line will have 10 of its 21 stations in Montgomery County, including stops at Bethesda, Littonsville, Silver Spring, and Long Branch. And each station will also include a major piece of artwork. And through our arts and transit program, artists were selected to capture the unique nature and personality of the neighborhoods. In Montgomery County, the Purple Line will connect with two branches of WMATA's Metro Rail System, as well as one of our marked commuter rail lines. And when the line is completed, people will be able to travel between downtown Bethesda and Silver Spring in about 10 minutes. Project <laughs> Projects like the Purple Line can really serve as a catalyst for economic development. And as Secretary Ron noted, uh, there are $2 billion in investment plans already along that corridor. That's because developers are seeking to attract people who want to live and work a stone's throw from the transit line. But we're also looking out for existing businesses. The Purple Line re uh, recently received a $2 million grant from the Federal Transit Administration to help coordinate and monitor transit-oriented development, business preservation strategies, and multi-mobility along the corridor. The grant uh, was actually the largest in the nation, part of FTA's pilot program for transit-oriented development planning. And this will fund a multi-agency effort to support goals identified by the Purple Line Corridor Coalition. The National Center for Smart Growth at the University of Maryland is the grant subrecipient and will lead the work uh, of this collaborative effort over the next two years. And we also just learned in October that J.P. Morgan Chase has committed $5 million to nonprofits to support affordable housing and small businesses along the Purple Line. This is the largest grant so far for efforts to combat gentrification. We'll continue meeting with our community advisory teams, providing project updates and addressing issues such as parking and business impacts. And while the Purple Line work continues, MDOT MTA is also making a significant investment in transit in Montgomery County through the operation of the Mark Train Service, Commuter Bus Service, and $44.2 million in operating and capital grants to support your local ride-on transit operation. This includes funds for the replacement of heavy-duty transit buses, as well as ongoing preventative maintenance. MDOT MTA continues to make investments in technology to enhance our riders' transit experience. Charm Pass, our mobile ticketing app, provides riders with a reliable and efficient way to pay for commuter bus and mark services from their smartphone. And to date, we've had more than 1 million Charm Pass purchases. And I strongly encourage you all to download the Charm Pass app today and use it. In addition, we continue our partnership with Transit App to provide bus real-time information to our riders. Uh, real-time information for commuter buses was added to the Transit App in June, and since the launch, 200,000 users have downloaded the app. We know Montgomery County residents also rely on Mark Commuter Rail Service to get to jobs in Washington, D.C., and other destinations. And our investment of $54 million to overhaul 63 Mark III passenger coaches is underway, with the entire fleet overhauled by 2021. This project includes upgraded seats, communications, air brakes, HVAC, and doors. We're also making improvements uh, to our locomotives. We've invested $61 million to deploy eight new Mark locomotives. We're also pleased to award $472,000 for Montgomery County's statewide transit innovation grant project, which will purchase and upgrade transit software to improve efficiencies in data collection, tracking and reporting, and include easier access and assignment for operators. And now I'll turn it over to Ricky at the Maryland Aviation Administration. Ricky. Good evening. Good evening. I'm excited to be here and speak with you this evening. So at about 30% of BWR Marshall's customer base, you represent one of the most important and loyal customer bases serving BWR Marshall Airport. So thank you for that. Um, the MDOT Maryland Aviation Administration offers excellent service and travel convenience for customers at BWR Marshall and Martin State Airports. In addition, MDOT MAA is responsible for fostering aviation throughout Maryland by working with 35 public use airports in the state. For fiscal year 2020, MDOT MAA will provide almost $2.5 million in state support for Maryland's public use airports. That includes Davis Airport in Laytonsville, 
which will receive $29,280 in state funding to support permitting fees. BWR Marshall remains a major international gateway for Maryland and the entire national capital region. With a new seven-year use and lease agreement in place, we are working with our airline partners to ensure the airport remains positioned to serve travelers with excellent service and facilities. This new agreement with 15 signatory airlines, these are full service airlines, will result in over $1.2 billion in revenues to the airport and nearly $800 million in capital projects. We're moving rapidly on an improvement program that will add services and amenities for customers while growing business and adding air service opportunities for the airlines. Construction is underway on a 55,000 square foot five gate extension to Concourse A, which serves Southwest Airlines. This project, which is expected to be complete in the summer of 2020, includes new food and retail concessions and updated restrooms. The work is an important first step in a multi-year upgrade to Terminal AB, which is the center of operations for Southwest Airlines at BWI Marshall Airport. BWI is also working to support the construction of a major aircraft maintenance facility for Southwest, our largest airline partner. This will be the airline's first maintenance facility in the Northeast. The airport is supporting overall construction of the maintenance base with about $50 million in infrastructure improvements, such as utility work, site preparation, and taxiway access. Meanwhile, air cargo operations at BWI Marshall have grown 80% over the past five years, and we expect the growth to continue. Widely recognized as the easy come, easy go airport for the Mid-Atlantic region, BWI Marshall remains committed to excellent customer service easy access and affordable airfare, airfares, thereby maintaining BWI Marshall's position as the busiest and most used airport in the national capital region. I want to thank you for your continued support of BWI Marshall, and I will now turn it over to Melissa Williams, representing the Maryland Transportation Authority. Melissa? Thank you, Ricky. Mm -hmm. The Maryland Transportation Authority is excited to begin delivering our third generation tolling system, which will revolutionize the way we serve our customers. The new system will upgrade toll collection hardware and software with the latest technology and completely modernize how the MDTA does customer service. As you heard, the MDTA board is considering a toll modernization proposal that puts this new system to work and saves our customers more than $28 million over five years. The proposal includes lower toll rates, a new payment option, and a new discount for our customers starting in 2020. First, toll rates would be reduced by 50% for motorcycles and would be cut 25 and 17% respectively for light vehicles towing one and two axle trailers, such as those used for watercraft or landscaping equipment. Second, a new way to pay called pay by plate will benefit infrequent toll customers as well as those who don't have a prepaid easy pass balance. And third, a new 15% discount for video tolling customers who pay the toll before their invoices are mailed. The board is scheduled to vote on a recommendation at its November 21st meeting. As Sec Secretary Ron mentioned, we've started all electronic tolling at the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and the Thomas J. Hayden Memorial Bridge. Cashless tolling is another reason to sign up for EasyPass, which gives drivers the lowest price for any toll. It saves time, is good for the environment, and signing up is easy. From fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2019, the number of Easy Pass accounts in Montgomery County increased by 12%. I'm sure some of those customers use the Intercounty Connector. In fiscal year 2019, transactions on the ICC increased by 6.35% for a total of nearly, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of nearly 36.9 million transactions. Now I'd like to hand things back to Secretary Vaughn for some final thoughts. Thank you, Melissa. And thanks again for having us here this evening. I'd like to close by noting that while you have heard a number of projects uh, and priority activities by MDOT, our number one priority across all of our business units is safety. Uh, it's evident not only in the hashtag we present online, which is hashtag M.safety if you want to follow us, uh, but through campaigns that stress work zone safety, speed enforcement, and ways to end impaired and distracted driving. 
I'd like to commend MDOT MVA's Highway Safety Office. Along with partners like you, the office is making strides in educating drivers on the importance of safe behaviors on our roadways. As an aside, we were in Howard County about a week and a half ago uh, with a simulator showing high school students what can happen when a car or truck rolls over and people aren't wearing a seat belt. The truck cab was spinning around and I think there were quite a few gasps from the crowd when the crash dummy came out of the window and hit the pavement head first. I believe demonstrations like this and peer activism can influence driving habits for the better. I would encourage local schools in Montgomery County to take part in our Make It Click campaign, which promotes seatbelt use for all drivers, all passengers. At our Highway Safety Summit in April, we announced an 8.5% decrease in highway fatalities uh, in Maryland compared to the previous year. That's encouraging, but our work is far from done. Finally, I would like everyone to take our traffic safety pledge. Many of you heard about this last year, and we're finding it's a great way to have peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I see Carrie in the back has those present. You can utilize these yourself in which it is a pledge that for 30 days you will follow these common lawful actions to be a better driver. And you might even want to use these with a spouse that you think might benefit from it. And particularly if you have young drivers in your house, uh, this is a great conversation starter about what you expect from them as they are driving on our highways. So with that, uh, if anybody wants to follow our next CTP tour meeting, which this is the next to last one, we have one more tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Oh, so I guess this isn't next to last. It's, so we're in the final, we're in the final stretch, but there are two more to go. And um, and you can actually follow those on hashtag CTP tour. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Just a few uh, pieces of housekeeping. I just wanted to recognize the vice chair of the Montgomery County Senate delegation, uh, Senator Susan Lee. Also, I want to remind everyone that we are televised. I think my uh, two kids, Ben and Sam, are watching. So let's make sure we're all on our best behavior because we've got kids watching. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to uh, Delegate Mark Horman. If your two kids are still watching after that, I'd be very, very <laughs> impressed. Uh, and should probably be fearing for a primary challenge for my job. Uh, so with that, let's turn it over to our county officials, County Executive Mark Elrich and uh, Councilman Tom Hucker, Chair of our County Transportation Committee, if you could both come up. Uh, for a few minutes. The floor is yours. And thanks for lending us this space this evening. I'm technically not lending it because I'm on the other side of the street now. <laughs> but it's a nice space. And thank you, thank you all for coming down. Yes. Um, we appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to start in the things we think are positive that we see happening. And first of all, we want to thank you all for the assistance on the Vision Zero work. Um, giving us the ability to lower speed limits in our urban areas to 25 miles per hour is actually a big deal. Uh, you're working with us on hawk signs and liberalizing our ability to use hawk signals in places we want to use them is going to let us further increase pedestrian safety. And as you know, we're experimenting with different configurations on corners and intersections. Everything we can do to make this um, safer for pedestrians in Montgomery County. Um, I want to thank you for working on the project where we're looking at uh, widening 355 from Germantown to Clarksburg, um, coupled with the bus rapid transit, we think we can bring uh, major service improvements to the, that part of the county that address both um, automobiles and the, and the real need for transit. Um, thank you for getting the Watkins Mill interchange on the way. I know this is going to make a big difference to people 
and that tied with the bus rapid transit or those things that are going to take some of the bottleneck off of 355 so that the residents in Clarksburg aren't running into the back end of a very, very long backup. I think that's important for us. Um, thank you for the work you've done on the Purple Line and related projects. I know the construction in, in Silver Spring on Colesville is going to be painful, um, but it's necessary because the steel beams aren't going to get there by themselves. Uh, I want to thank you for the Brookville bypass. And, um, and on I-270, the short-term mitigations, I'm looking forward to this whole thing wrapping. I know a lot of residents have been looking at the barriers and the construction and not knowing where this is going. So everybody will be thrilled when they actually see where this is going. So I think it's a big deal. And I also want to thank you for the Metro funding. That, that was important. Um, but I want to talk about some of our concerns as well. Um, first of all, the elimination of the CCT from the CTP. Um, we heard your concerns about the CCT route, and I actually agreed with the, those concerns when we passed the proposal. I thought that we went a little bit astray. Um, we had been working on an alternative, and we briefed State Highway on the alternative last winter, and we thought we were now back in the same ballpark, that we had taken the long, circuitous lump out, and we had some better ideas, and we really need this back. Um, the commentary about this being a local road project that doesn't go between two counties, well, A, I can fix that by running up into Frederick County, which would not be unheard of since it stops at Clarksburg, and there's certainly a need in southern Fre Frederick County. But the bigger thing is it's an economic development project, and I like to remind people that Montgomery County sends a lot of money to the state, and this is, will hold up our ability to do the Science Center where the Court of Cities Transitway is. It brings a hard stop to that project. The money from the companies that will want to be there, if we believe the story that 80% of Montgomery County dollars, 80 out of every 100 wind up in the state, that's a lot of money the state's walking away from. So if you're constrained budgetarily for lack of money, walking away from a project that's actually going to generate revenues at the end of the day, I think, is, is a mistake. And I would ask the governor, to please think about this and talk to the business community about how important they think it is for the economic health of the Life Sciences Center. Um, on the 495 I-270 toll roads, I appreciate the fact that we've opened the door to have a discussion. I'm not going to rehash when and where things should have happened. I'm happy that we're at the point now where we're having a conversation about it. Um, we continue to think that um, you can stay within the, bound, the walls of I-270 and that you can work on the western side and build that bridge over the Potomac, and those are the most important needs that we need addressed right now. And so I look forward to continuing looking at this project and examining it, and hopefully we'll all get to the same place. And I, I want to remind you and the governor that we never said no nothing. We asked just for a seat at the table to design something that we thought would be optimal for the community. And it, no, we don't like sitting in traffic any more than anybody else does. I dread my evening ride home to Tacoma Park when I'm sitting in this traffic. Um, so we all get the problem. We just wanted uh, a solution that we think would, would work for us. Uh, we're a little concerned about management of the Purple Line construction. We've had um, impacts in work safety zones. We've got the business impacts that we have, and I really think that um, we need more money from the state to help some of these businesses survive, particularly in downtown Silver Spring, which is going to be, a, I think, a long, rough road. Um, and there's no choice because the road's going to go on a narrow street. I mean, the tracks are going on a narrow street. It is going to be disrupted, but there are going to be unintended consequences from that. And the housing impacts, um, JBG's $5 million in, I think your kids can use this word, it doesn't do much. <laughs> it's, it's problematic because for the number of people there who are low income, any displacement is not really going to be managed by a $5 million sum of money. So if we're all playing in this, we're looking at what we can do on our part. We would encourage the state to join us um, through the housing department to make sure we have adequate resources to deal with the threat of displacement over there. Um, we struggle with what to do about pedestrian safety issues on state highways because we don't control the state highways. 
Um, I know you're, you guys have resource issues, but, but I'm saying this just the same because they are problems. Um, we need money for the planning of the Forest Glen Montgomery Hills project. I'm appreciative we got through the environmental stage, so we're now eligible. We did our part by pushing it up because we think it's a small enough bite that perhaps we can figure out a way to get this funded. But we need work at 29 and 28 and 198 and the U.S. 29 interchanges. Georgia Avenue at Norbeck Road continues to be a problem despite the ICC. There are too many cars coming out there, and it's narrowed down to one lane. We really need the bridge over Georgia to really deal with this issue. And that's been on the county's wish list for a very long time. And, uh, and lastly, I mean, the state's financial capacity, none of you plan not to have money. And I recognize that you've landed in the place where you don't have a lot of money. But I would encourage you to look for other resources. It's, it's not like this money is mad money that's just going to go to any little silly idea that people have. This is core investments in infrastructure. And everybody's got to be able to make core investments in infrastructure because the other side of those investments are jobs and opportunities. And so if we're just going to surrender and say state's got no money, we're broke, oh, well, uh, that doesn't bode well for Maryland's future. And so we would encourage you to look at some things. I've been a proponent of what Virginia does with special taxing districts. They raise a lot of money out of the commercial sector, and they do it deliberately because it helps them build the infrastructure over there. And the commercial sector in Virginia was supportive of all these taxes because they realized no transportation, no future growth. And those two things are intricately linked together. So I would ask for your consideration of some of this and always happy to talk with you. You have always been good to work with. I maintain a sense of humor. And Greg, I really appreciate your work over many years. So thank you very much. So County Executive, great to see you. And thank you very much for, for your working with us and vice versa and the engagement. And there, there certainly are enough issues that affect Montgomery County that uh, that we can have those conversations frequently if, if necessary. Uh, you raised four issues. I'll try to address those very quickly at a high level. We'll have to talk those things through at, at a later time. But CCT obviously is something that's been brought to my attention by many representatives and officials with from Montgomery County as well as yourself. Um, and just a couple of pieces to put that all in perspective is your reference to how much money from Montgomery County ends up within the state for it to spend. That doesn't represent dollars into the Transportation Trust Fund, which I know you know and certainly our, our legislators know is a totally separate fund. Our funding comes from you know, these dedicated fees that come to us. And the, the reality is the purple line is overwhelming the demands on the the trust fund for investment within transportation. So I can assure you Montgomery and Prince George's County are getting definitely getting multiples of their shares of investment dollars that are are coming to the counties uh, from the trust fund as well as the the funds uh, that, that support the operations of, of WMATA. So I, I, I want to assure you Montgomery is getting a very healthy fair share of, of our transportation dollars. Um, and why did the CCT you know, drop from the, the, the CTP? Last year we said this was going to happen. This year it happened. And the, the reality is we don't have the resources to continue our investments in, in much. And certainly, we've got to be looking at all modes of transportation which are requiring these investments. 42% of the trust fund is now going to transit. We have to draw a line somewhere. And so that's, that impacts that. We've invested $38 million in the design of the CCT to bring it to a 30% uh, design level. Um, it's frankly from that you can take it into construction. And we just don't have those resources. We, we just don't have them. You raised the issue of we should be looking for additional resources. I can tell you, as an administration, I think everyone knows where the governor is at. And if 
we don't all know, I would be shocked, which is the governor said no increases in taxes, no increases in fees. You know what? I, and which might surprise you given some of these signs I see out here, but I actually very much enjoy my job. And uh, if I'm going to keep it, uh, talking about raising taxes and fees is not a way to accomplish that. And so, I mean, we know that. So that's a conversation that's going to have to occur at a different level. And um, the, the P3 is, is a conversation that will continue. Um, you know, we are encouraged by the fact that a very strong majority of Montgomery County residents support uh, the, the development of express tollings. And, and, okay, well, so, well, no, no, so I understand you don't support it, but that's not representative of a majority of the county. And so, and right, so that conversation is going to continue. Okay. And then, and lastly, on the purple line, that, um, you know, we are <laughs> we're building 16 miles of rail, uh, which I see many of you should be supporting, and that is uh, through heavily developed areas, and we know it's painful, um, and we appreciate the fact that people have been working with us, but we know um, it's, it is, it's painful, and we are behind schedule on the implementation of it, but we are working with the contractor to catch up with, um, with our schedule. So we're, we're doing what we can there. You all have been very helpful to us, and you, county executive, your administration has been very helpful in trying to address these problems as they come up, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you. My, my, my last request would be, I'm not asking for money for the CCT, but keeping it on the list so as we go forward and try to get federal money, that has value in and of itself to be totally demoted off the list raises the question if we go in front of the feds as to whether or not the state is even interested or supportive of this project. Um, I'm well aware that there are, there are ways to do things, and I'm looking at every way I can possibly okay. come up with to do this. But please keep it on the list. I'm not telling you to give me a dollar figure. Just let it sit there so to help us if we're working with the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Zucker. Um, Chairman, that's nice to say, Chairman Zucker. Uh, Vice Chair Lee and uh, Chairman Corman for inviting me in uh, to share a few thoughts on behalf of the County Council. My name, again, is Tom Hucker. I, I chair the Transportation Environment Committee, um, and uh, I'm uh, glad to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts and that will largely track um, the County Executive. We're very much on the same page uh, on our priorities. Um, and thank you so much, Secretary Ron and, and Administrator Slater and your whole team for joining us tonight um, and for our outstanding delegation for participating in the hearing. Um, as you know, the county executive reminded you, Montgomery County is the mo largest popula most populous dense, uh, uh, jurisdiction in the state and the state's largest local economy, contributing the greatest share of, of tax dollars to the Maryland Treasury. Um, we have over a million Marylanders calling our county home and hundreds of thousands that travel through Montgomery and use our roads and our transit each day. And our priority is certainly to ensure that we move our residents and our workers through our county safely and efficiency. With a majority of our roads maintained, um, our main roads maintained by SHA and uh, many of our transit services at least partially funded by MDOT, collaboration between MDOT and local government is arguably the most important factor in impacting how well our constituents and our commerce moves through our county. Um, so I appreciate the chance to uh, share a few of these uh, comments on behalf of the council. First, I want to bring up, of course, the uh, 27495 project, our region uh, as you know, faces some of the worst congestion in the United States, and no one is more affected by that congestion than Montgomery County residents, and no one is more knowledgeable about the solutions and has more lived experience with that. Um, and we really believe the path to real congestion relief runs through and through with uh, a true collaboration with the county and its leadership. So we really hope to have greater collaboration with MDOT as that project moves forward. Um, as as uh, the county executive said, we have never said no. We want to see congestion relief that makes sense and is balanced and effective. And our council and county executive have put put forward a reasonable and balanced plan that our top transportation planners, our data scientists, our planning board all believe offers the most effective alternative for traffic relief in our region. 
could, so, you, could you clarify what which proposal that was? That would be the ICC diversion plan. And I'd like to ask um, where that is. I appreciate that it's been under study. Um, if you could clarify and commit that it will be retained as an alternative for the managed lane study. Okay. Uh, it will not. And we have presented the information to the inter governmental work group that was provided uh, two or three weeks ago. I know that the uh, county executive received a phone call that said that it, it doesn't work. Um, so there was, well, there will be uh, information that will be provided on that, but it, it doesn't work. It adds, it adds time to commutes. It does not address where the, the bulk of the commutes of where origin and destination is at. So, it, so I, I mean, I'm not going to play around. I'm just, I just told you. It, sure. It will not. So it will not be retained. It had the same level of, of analysis as the other uh, alternatives, and it, it didn't perform well. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I know that um, someone from the county serves on that, um, on the intergovernmental work group, but that information has been provided to them. It should be coming out very soon. Greg, do you can you fill in a timeline there? We have actually sort of jumped out in front of an announcement for everyone, mm -hmm. but uh, you asked the question and I want to answer it. I appreciate that. We, we have a number of presentations set up to really go through the details. I had a conversation with the county executive where I committed to come down and kind of walk through those pieces with them and look at the data and understanding. In general, what the team found was the commute traffic that's coming down 95, for instance, that's going across the Beltway, not a lot of it or not a large percentage of it is actually going all the way across, where some of it's jumping off on 97 and 185 or 185 and 29 and those types of things. So, you know, we were finding some different patterns that didn't really work well for the ICC, and then they were kind of getting into 270. So we'd be happy to sit down. I know we're getting ready to schedule some. We're working through some of the interagency work groups, so uh, I think we wanted to do our due diligence with those groups and understand kind of their comments and feedback. Um, but we'd be happy to sit down and go through it in detail as well uh, with everyone. Well, I appreciate your, we think obviously that that's a mistake. We, I appreciate your candor. I look forward to reviewing your analysis, and I'm sure that's true of uh, the entire council as well. Um, uh, I, I know you were both there when the governor at the Board of Public Works said it had a lot of good elements in it that we were, that you were going to look at adopting. So I'd like to know more about the, the, uh, the disconnect there. I'd also, um, certainly constituents are all asking, since we're all committed to protecting taxpayers, when will we see an investment grade analysis of your managed lane study? So that occurs once there is actually a design that's presented mm -hmm. and you see costs associated. Uh, the procurement that as we are pursuing this, we won't see designs until they are presented by uh, the, the various concessionaires that form. So we are, so right now we are working with financial advisors mm -hmm. uh, that deal in with this a lot mm -hmm. and they are giving estimates, but these are estimates without knowing what the design of the construction will be. Therefore, we don't know the capital expenditure costs of, of a design. So that is down the road, but I can tell you that we have not had uh, any shortage of uh, firms that have have been more than willing to pursue uh, this, and they will be making the decisions about how they invest their money. Since we have said we are not putting state money into these projects, mm -hmm. the net zero cost to the state, mm -hmm. therefore the companies will be making decisions about how they invest their money not the states. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it'll certainly affect um, our residents tremendously. And so I think I, I speak for many people, and we'd like to see that analysis as quickly as possible and as much detail as possible. May I ask I how, it. how it affects the residents there? I mean, well, it, if. Okay, guys, folks, yeah, hold folks, guys, hold guys this, appreciate your passion. Let's let Councilman Hucker and Secretary Ron have their dialogue. Well, they're, they're obviously affected. We all sit in congestion every day on public right-of-ways. 
and rights of way. And once any construction is approved and begins, um, we will be sitting in more construction delays due to construction as well. And we can talk more about yeah. that, you know, probably longer than we have tonight. Okay. But obviously, they'll be affect people will be affected every day by and for many years. Uh, and of course, I mean, we know that neighbors neighborhoods are being affected today because yes. of ways and Google that are taking this traffic through their neighborhoods now. And so hopefully we will be able to address some of that. But that right. as you say, we're not going to resolve this no, no, to, we won't. to either of our satisfaction certainly. here tonight. So you, right. Those neighbors express their anxiety to us all the time. Yep. Um, uh, we, there's also a lot of anxiety, of course, around the range of tool, tolls. We've talked about that. State law requires um, public hearings when the when the um, tolls are, are increased, but not, I don't believe, when they're set. Can you commit to public and legislative hearings at the initial toll setting stage? Okay. The, so the law establishes that the board of the Maryland Transportation Authority mm -hmm. will establish those tolls. And so they will have... I believe there are hearings that will take place uh, as a result of, of their activity. And so that's, that would be the process that would move forward. Again, I think it's important to note that, that these, these toll lanes are totally, totally voluntary. People can choose to use those or they can choose, or they can choose to stay in the free lanes that will remain. Right. Do you envision any, any legislative hearings or legislative oversight of that process? Uh, at this time, that it doesn't, it's not a, a set that way, but we are having a number of conversations with legislators, and we've had conversations with legislators right. uh, over this period of time. But uh, my anticipation is, we, I mean, again, we've got to get through a NEPA process, right. and that NEPA process will be making a number of, you know, of recommendations and proposals that will be presented to the public and legislators have the same opportunity as everyone else. But of course, we, we pay attention to legislators and uh, we will hear, I'm sure there will be no shortage of comments on uh, our, our draft EIS. Sure. Okay. Last couple questions on this topic, I promise. Mr. Slater, you've, you know, I've talked in, I've seen you at Board of Public Works and other public forums assuring taxpayers that they will not be on the hook for this project at all, as, as the Secretary has as well. As you know, as well as I do, there's always a high risk of, of financial troubles during construction, especially with a project as complicated and historic as, as this size, um, as this size and complexity. The nightmare scenario, of course, is if the developer, um, uh, has financial hardships during construction and then approaches the General Assembly, MDOT, to say who's going to pay for the rest of it. Can you assure us that the developer and not the taxpayer will pay performance and payment bonds at least through the construction so the subcontractors will get paid yeah. without any risk to the taxpayers? Yes. Great. Um, terrific. Um, I want to echo some of the, the uh, county executives' concerns about the Corridor City's transitway. Um, I, I hear you about not having the money. Obviously, there's a very large budget that has been spent on many projects that are worthy and some that I think are going to be used by fewer Maryland taxpayers. Um, we are very disappointed to learn that it was removed from the CTP. I echo the county executives' request to restore it, even in, without funding at this stage. Um, our constituents have heard earlier assurance from you, Mr. Secretary, that it was likely to be a component of whatever project occurs along I-270 to address congestion on that corridor. And a lot of people find it hard to have faith in your commitment to relieve, relieve congestion on that corridor if there's only roads and no CCT. It seems like those are quite at odds. So the commitment mm -hmm. has been that the portion of the revenue sharing that occurs from a P3 and from the toll revenues that are paid uh, will be turned over to the, the affected counties and the counties can make decisions about what they want to do with those revenues and if Montgomery County wants to put their share of those revenues into the CCT, that's, that will be an option of the county. 
Right. You, I mean, of course, this has been in multiple CTPs, and four governors, I think, uh, uh, you know, representing both parties, have always thought of this as a state project. So this, we, we view this as a real, um, real change from the past. Third, update of arterial roads. Um, our arterial roads, of course, are the spines of many of our downtown areas, Silver Spring, Wheaton, White Flint, um, Bethesda. Uh, unfortunately, many of these roads were designed in an era when pedestrian safety um, and multimodality was really an afterthought if it was considered at all. We certainly want to continue to work with the State Highway on updating the arterial roads to relieve congestion. We're very pleased by the work SHA did on Georgia Avenue in Wheaton. Thank you. Last fall, we want to see more projects like that on our arterial roads throughout the county. And of course, both the state and the county, as has been mentioned, adopted Vision Zero. We're proud to be the first local jurisdiction to do that. Ensuring that it's more than a slogan requires a lot of action and funding from SHA. So we're grateful for the lowering of the speed limits. We're excited about SHA choosing alternative 5B in Montgomery Hills. And we're um, look, looking forward to uh, seeing administrators later on November 19th, I think it is, for the briefing just on Vision Zero um, uh, on that topic. Okay, two final questions. One, funding for the draft CTP is 3.5% less than Governor Hogan's first CTP five years ago. When you take inflation into account, the reduction is much greater. Um, do you have plans to support any revenue increases in the upcoming General Assembly session to enable MDOT's funding responsibilities and commitments? No. Sounds like you answered that. MDOT has spent more than $40 million for planning and design of a dozen state highway projects on US-29. Maryland 28, 97, 117, 124, and 198. Most of these projects in the aggregate will cost in the range of 800 million to 1.3 billion. They've languished in the D&E program for more than a decade. When do you believe State Highway will start these projects and carry them through to completion? I have no idea. Okay, thank you so much. So I would point out, as you refer to the CTP from Governor Hogan's first CTP till now is that we have, in fact, delivered a record program in record time. And so the if you look at last year's CTP and the year before that, you'll see that they are up significantly. And in fact, much of this is due to the 1,069 projects that we have actually delivered over that period of time. So I think referring from just 15 to today presents the you know, a, a misimpression of what's actually occurred over the last five years. So thank you. Thank you. We look forward to future collaboration. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to our county officials. We'll now shift to some of our uh, state delegations, starting with District 14, Senator Zucker, Delegate Kaiser, Delegate Lutke, and Delegate Queen. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and uh, everyone else for coming out today. I want to start just by um, thanking uh, in particular uh, the District 3 Engineer's Office and the, the folks um, at some of the local shops who uh, continue to be incredibly supportive to us when we have constituent services concerns. Um, just as an example, um, as, as you might expect this time of year, we have a lot of issues with deer on our roads up county. Um, and uh, last week I, I spotted a one in the roadway on the way to work and called it in and it was gone by the time I came home, which I appreciated greatly. Um, so good work there. Um, we're going to have a series of questions for you about some of the uh, particularly state highway projects in our district. So administrators later, be prepared. Um, but I, I want to start um, by asking about 198. So um, I have brought up uh, the last couple of years, and Mr. Slater, I brought up again in our meeting earlier this year, um, the idea of splitting off Section D from the um, 198-28 corridor study and finding a way to potentially fund it independent because it is the key part of that study for our district, for the residents of, of Burtonsville and for the, the Burtonsville Business District. So I wonder if you all have had any additional conversations about that idea Uh, so I think you're exactly right. That section in Burtonsville is not only the key, but I think it's very different than the other parts of the corridor and, and very different in terms of what the solution uh, could be there, where you, know, you look on the 
the west side is 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 probably more constrained than than that centerpiece. But I think you have very different goals in that Burtonsville mm -hmm. section. So as we're coming to kind of the final stages of those environmental approvals, that, that planning study, I think we get to that point of you know what's the first phase that we want to uh, move forward on, and and so we're we're in that kind of process now. I will uh, you know kind of caveat that to a certain extent that we do have some some funding limitations, so we're trying to understand what that next phase is, what that looks like, what's the kind of shape of that. Um, but I think what we've heard from the community is that section in Burtonsville is very clearly kind of the, the section that folks want to have addressed first. Mm -hmm. So any idea when we'll know for sure that that's taking place and when those potential funding conversations might occur? Yeah, the, the funding question is probably a little bit tougher, uh, but I think when we get towards the uh, end of this year, beginning of next year, we should have a final kind of decision on, on where we are with that footprint. We've been trying to manage uh, some of the concerns not only from the residents but also the businesses there's a lot of concerns from businesses in limiting turning movements up and down that corridor where you know we've been working with uh, some of the businesses that are very concerned about ruining those left turns where specifically in Burtonsville we want to create more of that median in there and kind of limit some of those turning movements to make that a much safer environment uh, make so, it walkable and bikeable. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're working through those now, um, trying to have some collaborative dialogue with the businesses. But uh, I think it's very clear, clear that that section is one that they want to get to first. So once we get there, then we'll have a, a bit greater ability to kind of break it apart. Um, I'd be happy to schedule a follow-up meeting and kind of show you the different ways that we might be able to break it apart sure. uh, and then focus kind of there. Because I think you can go with varying approaches in terms of, minimal investment in design to get it where you need to be in terms of 30 percent, something along that line. Um, there are some utility issues that we're going to have to address before implementation in that corridor as well. So, you know, I think uh, the Burtonsville section, once we get to that determination of exactly what the final footprint is there, you know, when Andre's team is dealing with smaller system preservation projects or resurfacing projects, we can use that as an opportunity to, to move the bar a little bit as opposed to kind of waiting for the big full-blown type project and, and I think be. if we can get that solution on the books then it gives us a greater opportunity to address it when the opportunities arise like a resurfacing project like we did in Wheaton right right that would be fantastic um, two related issues where we'd like to ask um, SHA to consider studying um, mm -hmm. Uh, issues in the area. One is the the old 29 section that goes through Burtonsville uh, that that is um, goes essentially from the the overpass on the north side of Burtonsville down to 198 is a, a significantly overbuilt road now because it was built for the traffic that used to be on 29. So now we have nine lanes for uh, vehicle traffic of less than 12,000 cars a day, um, and so we'd like the state to consider. Um, a, a road diet study, um, which would free up some uh, potentially land for some of the economic development projects that we need to develop in the area, but also contribute to making um, Burtonsville much more walkable and bikeable. Um, I don't know if that's something you can commit to. I'm happy to take a look at it. Okay. Happy to take a look at it. You know, those are the kind of opportunities that, that you want to look for in creating those types of environments. They don't work for every roadway, mm -hmm. but but certainly uh, we can take a look at it. and. Uh, Maybe I can follow up with your office and we can sit down and look at the traffic and, and what kind of pedestrian movements and sure. bike movements are happening in the area, some of the activity centers that we can focus on, you know, getting people in the right spots. So That'd be great. Um, one final ask. Um, a, a couple of years ago, um, the uh, State Highway did a, a, a signal study um, just west of the intersection of Old 29 and 198 uh, in the... Um, uh, one of the most dangerous sections of that road, which is the entrance to the 7-Eleven and the um, the new shopping center. Um, and so the property owner on the south side there in the 7-Eleven and the old mattress shop has just gotten a, a zoning uh, change from the county that will allow them to um, uh, redevelop the site a little bit, add some additional capacity. Um, we're concerned that that'll increase traffic safety issues even more. Um, that is, if you drive through 198 in Burtonsville, clearly the most dangerous part of the road. So um, the uh, owners of that property commissioned a traffic study which did find um, enough issues to, to warrant a traffic light. So we'd like to follow up with you and request that SHA reopen that um, and take a look again. 
That's not one that was on my radar, so I had to take a look at it. I don't know if um, uh, Andre's team was looking at it, but we can certainly, maybe we can all sit down and kind of walk through it. But. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Well, help. hello. I'm glad to have you here again in uh, Montgomery County. I do want to also thank you for some of the efforts you've been doing with uh, Easy Pass for some of our constituents, so we, we appreciate that. Uh, while we're kind of in that uh, Burtonsville area, one of the things our constituents have asked is, um, as an ask as we do a cost analysis uh, versus the traffic uh, circle that's planned at Route 198 and um, uh, Peach Orchard Road to look at some alternatives there. So um, that's pretty much the, the only ask that I have, if we can look at that for a cost analysis. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Delegate Queen. Uh, I had two questions as well about some updates on different studies. Uh, first, uh, I did want to uh, compliment Administrator Neiser uh, for Real ID and MVA. I was uh, through the triage line, as as were the people who came in before me. Someone said it was just because I was an elected official, but everyone who came in when I did was through the triage line, waited a few minutes, and through the other part of the line and out the door within a dozen minutes, start to finish. So it was a pretty good process when you bring all the right documents with you. So well, thank you. We uh, had I, a, a situation which I have to tell you about. I'm just to very quickly here is we were doing a press event on seat belts in the in Baltimore City and this lady came by and she goes I got out of here in seven minutes and she was talking and the media was all watching her and so the cameras all turned to her and she goes seven minutes I was out and there was a gentleman behind her going I got out less than that <laughs> it was just and he wants to know why he wasn't going to be on the cameras but I mean it is it, it's amazing what what Chrissy and her team are doing and that's Thank you for, for those comments. Well, certainly, and I was posting on Facebook to everyone to make sure they follow the rules correctly so they could get in and out just as easily. Uh, also, still in the 198 area, we had some questions about the setting the design of the proposed Maryland T intersection in front of the Spencerville Academy. So obviously, we have some concerns there on 198, so we'd like some update on that study, as well as the update on the sidewalk study for uh, 198 from Dino to McNew. So if there's anything you can provide now or at a later time, that would be great. Sure. The, the study itself is, uh, is in the final stages. Uh, so, you know, I've always, I, we get updates to those and I've asked them to work through some of the community and constituent concerns before kind of bringing them uh, to me for final concurrence. So uh, I'll specifically ask about that Maryland T and, and, and work through that. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Zucker. Thank you very much, Delegate Kaiser. So just uh, two quick things. One is, uh, uh, Administrator Slater, we already spoke about Brook Road and 108. Um, there's a uh, there's construction that needs to be done. There's emergency vehicles, Mr. Secretary, that comes through. And uh, apparently I read in the newspaper that it has no funding anymore for that intersection. But uh, in order to help our men and women in public safety, we need that to be uh, looked at. So I appreciate your help there. And then also, um, I know we worked together to get the Brookfield beer, beer uh, form, some signage, and Wardaka wants the same. So if we can help Wardaka with uh, making sure people know where they are, we, uh, the team and I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The very efficient District 14 team. Uh, we'll double up now with uh, District 15, Delegate uh, David Frisardago, and District 16, Delegate Love, and Senator Lee. Now I'm on? Now I'm on. All right, thank you. Uh, it's been a year since I've done this. Um, so uh, let me start out by saying uh, David Fraser Dago, District 15, um, and I wanted to just highlight a couple of things. One, a big thank you for the uh, Transportation Town Hall that we had last week uh, in Germantown to kind of highlight all the um, issues that the Up County and Frederick is, is, um, is dealing with and the challenges. So very much thank you to Greg Slater for coming out and um, for the conversation. We had a, a little over 300 people up there, which is a, which I know doesn't mean a lot for the down county, but for the up county, that's a lot of people. And so we were very happy to have that, to have that showing. 
Um, with that said, a couple a couple of other things I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much to SHA and, and the county and, and others, but specifically for dealing with all of the traffic lights in downtown Boyd's. And I'm going to get to why we have these traffic light problems in downtown Boyd's, which is a tiny little community, but we had to put two traffic lights in, and it only took four years to do it for, for a variety of reasons. But thank you very much um, to your team um, for staying on task and getting it done. There were a lot of players involved. CSX was involved. The county was involved. Um, the park was involved, so it was a very complicated issue. Um, but we're, we're, we've taken that on, and that's one big piece behind us. We still have some more work to do in Boyd's, which I know that we're working on actively. So I wanted to say thank you for that. And um, so now the, the big asks, I suppose, that I wanted to get to. Um, three, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just talk about really where Clarksburg and where Germantown and where the northern part of, um, you know, moving all the way up 270 toward Frederick and Hagerstown and all the way up to Pennsylvania and all the way over to West Virginia is. And the reason that those traffic lights had to go into that tiny little town of Boyd's is because the traffic that's coming out of Pennsylvania, the traffic that's coming out of West Virginia, those tags I see running up and down a lot of local old rural roads all the time. And um, that's why we had to put traffic lights in Boyd's. And that's why I'm asking you, uh, and I know that the county executive talked about it a little bit as well, 355 from Germantown to Clarksburg is vital. Um, the, the folks in Clarksburg, the folks in Urbana, all the way up, they cannot get out of their neighborhoods. So folks in Clarksburg can't even get down to Germantown. In some cases, it's taking them 35 and 40 minutes to get from Clarksburg to Germantown. And I know many of you probably know that's not a, that's not a big distance. That's a blink of the eye on 270. Um, but it's not moving. And um, so we need to really build out some of these secondary roads. So I would really ask. I know that's been asked before. Uh, and the other one that I'm going to talk about, so that's the big one. And the other one that I really want to talk about is um, the CCT. I know it's been beat to death, but the simple fact of the matter is the CCT, the Quarter City Transit Way, uh, helps to deal with not only coming off a of Shady Grove, but it, you know, in its final phase is ComSat. That's Clarksburg. So we have massive transportation problems in the northern part of the county. People cannot get out of their neighborhoods. People cannot get home on time to see their kids. People cannot help their kids with their homework. People um, cannot, some, in some cases, can't get home to tuck their kids in or have dinner. I know you know all this, but so that's why I'm, I'm, I really want to focus on the Quarter City Transit Way. I know there's a money issue with it, but there's also a massive quality of life and an economic development issue as well with the Quarter City Transit Way. Um, and I guess that's, that's for the most part um, it. I do want to stress two other projects, um, River Road and Seneca Road. I know you guys are working on that. That's a very dangerous intersection. I know we're trying to come up with some solutions to how to address that. There have been some people that have been hurt, and I think there, have been, uh, I think there may have even been a fatal on, in that area. So I'd like to kind of push that along a little bit more. We can talk about that offline. And also when we're talking about a lot of um, – a lot of different ways of thinking about traffic congestion. I know that the, I don't think anybody here has mentioned the monorail coming out of Frederick. I know some people think that that is a pie in the sky. Some people think we need to study it. I know it's being studied right now. Um, I think it, it has the potential to be a really incredible project, depending on how long and how far it goes, whether it just goes from Frederick with its stops in Urbana, uh, Comsat, or Clarksburg, and Germantown, and Washington Grove, all the way over to Shea Grove, or if it does a lot more than that. But I do think that it isn't um, the monorail is an undervalued um, potential asset for the county and for the region that has been laughed at by big oil and big gasoline for generations, and so people don't take it seriously. And, and I find that personally a shame that, that we're not, we don't take that a lot more seriously than we should. Again, it's all about getting people, you know, into their cars so they can spend money on gasoline and buy cars, and there are other options. And this, this took place, I guess, after World War I when we started ripping up all the tracks. So um, with that said, those are my big asks. I'm happy to talk offline about them and pass them on to my colleagues. Thank you. Is, is it on? Yes. Uh, again, Secretary Rahm, thank you for coming here to present your plan to us. With respect to the FVA, I have to say my 89-year-old mother and myself and my husband had a pretty good time getting our real ID, so your staff is doing a great job, so I want to thank you on that. But I have just a very short question, just a yes or no question. As you know, uh, we, we are very concerned in, in District 16 and the surrounding areas around that about the uh, about the expansion and about the toes, and of course it's going to cost, we, we think, about $11 billion. It's a very expensive project, 
that uh, may disrupt a lot of communities because, you know, where it goes through and taking up houses and that sort of thing. And also, it, uh, we, it may even add to congestion in, instead of reducing it. So um, we're, we're worried about the expense that uh, this will cost and that and the taxpayers will end up paying for it. Um, so my quick question is, is um, are you saying that if uh, whether or not is northern part of the I-270, will that be widened if the southern part of I-270 is widened? Just a yes or no. Um, I mean, actually, you did ask a yes or no question, so good. Often I'm told yes or no, and it's not a yes or no question. So, yes, we are pursuing – our program is going to run from Frederick to the Beltway and the So Beltway you will widen around. both parts. You will widen – if you widen the southern part – of I-270, you will right. widen the northern part of I-270. What that particular looks like uh, from 370 north to Frederick, we won't know what that looks like until we have the, the NEPA addressed there. I mean, of course, no build is always an option, but until we get through the NEPA but process But did you want to widen it, this if you're not sure? Because this is – there's – the issue of if one is not what they call, I guess, uh, what do they call it, independent utility, mm -hmm. that you can't proceed forward with the other no. segment? No. So independent utility means you could do one or the other. Right? So that's independent utility is, is that one can function without the other. Right? So. Uh, but this is one big project, right? So we have a program in place, and our intentions are, right, to address congestion, and that's what the program's intent is, is congestion from Frederick to the Beltway and around the Beltway. And it's eventually it would get, assuming we can get through the NEPA process, it would eventually go all the way to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Well, the concern is if you widen the uh, southern part, but you don't widen the northern part, it's going to be even worse because you're having like eight right. lanes going into two. So we so, have a program. So it, it's a program that includes 270 from Frederick to the Beltway, right, as we talk about 270. So the answer is no. yes, no? Yeah, so yes, our intent is to address all the way Frederick to the Beltway with express managed lanes. That's our intent. And we have to, and again, we have to get through the NEPA process. Um, but so the answer is, given that caveat, so the answer is yes. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Love, and together with Senator Lee, Chairman Corman, and Delegate Ariana Kelly, I represent District 16. Our district runs. Um, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, along 495, up to 270, and along the river. So you can imagine that I hear a lot from my constituents about the 495-270 project. It's been addressed some here, and uh, Senator Lee had a question. I'm sure others will address that. I'm going to address the second thing I hear the most about from my constituents, and that is airplane noise. Um, I see in the um, plan that there is a little bit about airplane noise, and I have two questions along those lines. Um, the first on this residential sound insulation program, is that only for houses near BWI? Um, that is correct. Why is that? Um, because um, um, BWI Marshall Airport is responsible for noise that's, that's, um, that occurs as a result of activity out of that airport, the noise that this community experiences out of Reagan National Airport. So I understand um, that, but so, they're still so, Maryland so residents. We, right, and so um, so we do work. Maryland has three representatives on the MWA board. We work closely with them to make sure that, that um, MWA is responsibly addressing noise issues out of Reagan National Airport. And so they should be conducting a noise impact study um, that will result in the kind of, of sound mitigation efforts that we're doing at BWI Marshall Airport. Okay. So, Ricky, isn't that established by state law where those funds can be expended over by BWI? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's both state and federal law. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, and then my second question is, I understand that there have been discussions with the governor about funding a study on health impacts as a result of that airplane noise, and I was hoping that you all could address the status of that funding. I think that's with the Department of Health. That's not been with us. Um, what I, I, I'm, I'm only aware that, um, um, that someone in the legislature was considering such a study, but I'm not aware of the administration itself considering a study. So that hasn't been brought to your the, the attention? Only, the only study that we would conduct is what's called a Part 150 study. Um, that is the federally mandated study to determine the impact of noise, the communities that are impacted by noise, and what, what mitigation efforts you would engage to... Um, um, to deal with aircraft noise, but it doesn't address health issues resulting from noise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. We will now move on to District 17. Uh, Chairman of the Environment and Transportation Committee, Kumar Barve, Delegate Polakovich Carr, and Delegate Gilchrist. Uh, well, let me start. First of all, thank you very much. Welcome to District 17. Uh, we represent uh, Delegate Plakovich Carr, Delegate Gilchrist, and Senator Kagan, and I represent Rockville and the city of Gaithersburg, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me begin by saying that uh, I look forward to continue to working with you and your excellent staff. It has been a pleasure to work with all the ones who I've had a chance to work with, and I wanted to compliment them Right, right off the bat before I start to trash you horribly. So, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, in any case, uh, let me uh, reiterate uh, the comments that were made by the county executive, the county council, and the delegates and senators who preceded me. These are uh, concerns that we all share, whether it's the Quarter City Transit Way or the I-270. I know that for you, my position with respect and the position of the District 17 team with respect to I-270 is not a mystery, but for the sake of uh, clarity and for the record, I will repeat that, of course, we do not want to have the footprint of I-270 widened. And perhaps only speaking for myself, I will say that I'm not opposed to toll uh, lanes, but I do want for the number of free lanes to remain exactly the same, and my view is that a, a greater priority should be uh, directed toward the bottleneck on I-270 between Gaithersburg and the city of Frederick, because my constituents and many of my colleagues in the Frederick area feel that that is really uh, where the primary choke point is. But we can discuss all those things in the future. Uh, so let me let me just reiterate, reiterate, re reiterate something that I've told you and your staff and and your. Um, uh, uh, before, and that is that the Environment and Transportation Committee is going to continue its very uh, in-depth oversight not only of the I-27495 project, we're also going to begin to do a more comprehensive study of a lot of the areas in transportation. And in particular, one thing I do want to bring up, and that is the, uh, the contract and the use of, trans of, of cell phone uh, uh, information to determine what our uh, where people go and where the, uh, where where they originate and where they go to. We will uh, take a look at that as a take a look at that as a committee. As a committee, we are and I am very uh, interested in making sure that individual privacy is protected in the course of bring uh, aggregating all this information. And then finally, I want to reiterate a comment that was. Uh, made by the the chair of my transportation subcommittee, David Fraser Hidalgo, when he, he mentioned the monorail. I'm also very interested in having my committee look into the engineering and mathematics of that. I understand that the Board of Public Works made a decision to direct you to look into that, and that's mm -hmm. something we're going to want, want to have more information about. Mm -hmm. I have no questions. I simply wanted to set the stage for what I, be what I believe my committee will be undertaking in the next 90-day uh, session, and I look forward to working with you and your staff and everyone here as I have in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I look forward to that, that engagement as we have for the last five years. Um, 
cell phone probes are the, mm -hmm. the term for what we use, okay. which we're more than happy to have that conversation, and I think we can assuage any fears regarding that. And I can assure you that the monorail is absolutely being studied. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Good evening. For the record, Good evening. Delegate Julie Plokovic Carr. Um, I had two topics that I wanted to address tonight. Um, first one has to do with public transportation on I-270. So, of course, the public transit alternatives were dropped um, last year as part of the study of I-270 and the Beltway. Um, however, there has been the public transit working group that you mentioned uh, in your remarks earlier this evening. Could you speak to how the recommendations from that working group are going to be incorporated into the plans uh, for the P3 project? So there won't actually be recommendations, but what we are doing is we are engaged with the transit professionals to, uh, to determine how can we ensure that express toll lanes would incorporate systems within the area. So for instance, the use of uh, you know, the uh, buses using the express toll lanes at no cost, right? That's, that's an example of you know, buses currently avoid 270 and 495 because the, the traffic is unreliable. They can't deliver on schedules because of that. Uh, having access to express toll lanes uh, will be, actually, I consider that to be a form of uh, bus rapid transit when they're going to be on roadways that would have a, you know, a set speed limit that uh, the system will be uh, designed to deliver. So. That would be an example. Another would be where would be the best locations for uh, park and rides, and where could you know what facilities throughout that corridor would best complement existing uh, usages of of the system by transit. Thank you for that clarification. So, if, if there were particular. Um, let's say pain points that were identified that might inhibit, uh, say, commuter buses or local buses from being able to use the express lanes um, in terms of actual infrastructure within I-270 or the Beltway, um, would there be considerations made for that in the P3 to make sure that, that yeah. those are being addressed as construction if it does right. occur? Right. I mean, there's always, you know, all the, the factors that have to be considered, but that's what we're looking for, is we're, we're looking for areas that we can uh, assist the operation of transit within the region. And again, our, our goal is a balanced system. Thank you. Um, the second topic that I want to bring up, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the mayor of Gaithersburg, who's going to be speaking later, uh, but has to do with uh, the Watkins Mill interchange, since the construction is going to be complete uh, later next year, uh, and Maryland 117 Clapper Road. The study for that uh, particular roadway has been on hold, I think, since 2006, uh, but given that Watkins Mill Interchange is going to be complete and putting additional traffic onto that roadway, can you speak to uh, what the state's uh, plans are maybe looking to the future in terms of um, mitigating the additional traffic that will be coming on that roadway mm -hmm. and those roadway improvements? This is easy. Greg, Andre. <laughs> Let me touch broadly. I think one of the real benefits uh, of that Watkins Mill Road interchange is the ability to take some of the traffic off of roadways like one, 117 and 124. So I think, you know, we're, we're going to have to really monitor that. You know, some of the older looks at that corridor may not be the right look at that corridor because there's a lot of changing dynamics with that interchange in place. But, uh, you know, we're actively ready to look at those, understand those, as well as some of the intersections that you're kind of getting past once you get off that, what, that new Watkins Mill Road interchange, how those intersections function right past there. So I've actually been speaking with the mayor a little bit about some of those uh, now, but but certainly that's that's one that's on our radar as we try to understand how the traffic will normalize with this new access point and along I-270, but also that surrounding network. You know, the real benefit uh, of that Watkins Mill interchange is taking traffic off those other pain points north and south of that where everybody was kind of funneling to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, we'll now go on to District 18, Delegate Solomon and Shetty, and District 19, Delegate Stewart. Just start. Whoever wants to start, go ahead. 
Thank you, Chairman Zucker, um, Chairman Corman, Vice Chair Lee. Thank you for for giving us the opportunity, and thank you to the MDOT team for being here. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with with a lot of you recently, so I just wanted to say it's good to see you in the county again, um, and appreciate you being here. Um, wanted to just start off by um, thanking you for the continued support on Montgomery Hills. Um, I want to thank you, Administrator Slater, for continuing to work with uh, with District 18 and District 20 in the county. Um, we're looking forward to our meeting next week. Uh, we just uh, would say we we urge urge the continued work with, um, with Secretary Schultz, who was gracious enough to come out on literally, I think, one of the hottest days of the summer to tour uh, to tour the corridor and, and see the tremendous economic development benefits that could come from realizing uh, the work that we've been doing. So we're hoping uh, we're not going to make it to 50 years. We've made it past 40 years on working uh, working for the design, so we just urge you all to, to move forward on that. Um, Another thing I wanted to, to thank you on is the work that your team has done with uh, with our team on pedestrian safety. I'm glad to see the context guide, and uh, we're glad your team will be with us tomorrow night on Connecticut Avenue. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen too many deaths or near deaths. Um, so, looking forward to continuing to make progress on that. The the one question on pedestrian safety that I did want to ask, because you know we have a lot of issues that we spent a lot of time on, um, would just like uh, an update and a commitment um, on when we can. I know your team has been working on the study of that Glenmont, Randolph, uh, Randolph Hill, or excuse me, Glenmont, Glenmont area, Randolph Road, Laytonsville Road, and Georgia Ave interchange, and how how we can improve the the safety issues there, given the the two near or the two recent fatalities, unfortunately, and when we could expect the the study and the work that you're doing on that, and and when we could potentially get a community meeting on the books to discuss that as well. Certainly, that that's. One that's very much on our radar that we're trying to work through, you know, one of the th challenges that we have is as we started going down the implementation of this context guide, the uh, about 80 percent of the, those arterials were designed between 1930 and 1960. So, you know, we have a lot of kind of work ahead of us as we're looking at some of those changing travel patterns and, and a more updated design to fit better with that context. But that that's one. Um, we can certainly work with you. That We have a list of probably about 50 of them that we're really working through today. Uh, we're very focused on Beers Mill right now. We're very focused on 410. We're very focused on 355. Um, but we can certainly work on, on some of those other ones as well. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, so switching gears a little bit, um, Administrator Quinn, and appreciate you spending uh, some time with me a couple of weeks ago, uh, particularly on the mark issues. Um, I was excited to see the plan that came out, obviously, for the for the long-term expansion. Um, would urge you all to be funding that, to see that. You know, you mentioned the Purple Line. Um, I think it will be transformational when the Purple Line will be connected to New Carrollton so Montgomery County residents can get to the Mark Station to go up to Baltimore and to the Northeast Corridor. Um, hopefully, we can get to a point where uh, we have more regular Mark service, so that's more reliable. And I guess I just had two sort of specific questions um, related to, as the negotiations are ongoing, and, and Mr. Secretary, this may involve you as well. As negotiations are ongoing with West Virginia on continuing, hopefully, that mark service, so we don't want those people coming onto our roads if we can avoid it. Um, if we are able to, to get new revenue from West Virginia, do you have any thoughts or ideas on where that money is going to go? I would urge you to hopefully reinvest it back in the mark system, potentially some pilot programs, but curious if there are ideas or thoughts on that. So, for a period of over 20 years, Maryland taxpayers have been paying for the service to West Virginia. So we have last year had addressed this with West Virginia. They had said they needed to have a year to accommodate the increased costs. We had told them we've been spending about $3.5 million to provide that service. Um, last year they provided $1.5 million, and the, com and the conversation with them had been to get to 3.5. Um, Initially, as I, I think the newspapers have covered clearly, was they came back with, I think, actually a little less than $1.5 million this year. We told them that would pay for one round trip of, of the train. Um, I, have, in fact, was talking to the West Virginia DOT today uh, to find out where they are. They've asked for another week to resolve this in a conversation with their governor. Um, we are holding off, pulling the trigger. But uh, if we get $3.5 million, there's nothing to invest uh, because it will pay for this, the cost of the service to West Virginia. So right now we do not have those funds budgeted uh, since either we get the money and provide service or we don't get the money and don't provide. So either way, there's not additional uh, resources available to us to invest. 
I would just say we, ha we haven't gotten that money for 20 years, so if we get it, hopefully we can use it. It is, as, as you said, we're not cutting the spending in the CTP. We're just spending more, less than we had before. So I would say sort of similar similar budget math. Hopefully we could we could use that money. Um, the other question I had, you had mentioned the, the Howard Street Tunnel. Um, and obviously it was great to see the money from the federal government come in. We're obviously about 90 to $95 million short on that. So I guess I, I would ask and, and I would urge as we negotiate with CSX, we know how important that tunnel project is obviously to the port and the continued economic um, you know, security of the state and growth. But um, if we are, I guess, are there plans for the potential state to pay for the, the remainder of that? Where are we with our negotiations with CSX? And if we are going to pay more, is there a possibility to get uh, additional track time on CSX rails for MARC or for commuter benefits? Or how is that conversation progressing? Those are ongoing conversations right now, negotiations with CSX. I don't think we're at a point that we can announce anything. Okay, great. Um, and the, the last topic that I just wanted to touch on, I, I think probably no surprise, uh, and, and again, I will say I appreciate that though we've butted heads consistently on the Beltway, that your team has been uh, really helpful and, and uh, great to work with on a lot of other issues. Um, I won't repeat a lot of the other topics. I'll just echo the, the sentiments that were, that were mentioned. I did have two specific questions, though. Um, the origin and destination study was mentioned, and uh, was wondering if and when we could expect that data to be released so that we could all see the data and assumptions that you're working off of. We think we're going to go, so we used a somewhat of a proprietary data source that was kind of a software by service type of an environment. So we're trying to find the right solution there. The team's still working on that to really, what data product can we give you as uh, to be able to dig into the details? Because I really, I understand the value of digging into those details. So we're trying to not, we're trying to get to some of the raw data that we can give to the group and not violate this kind of software as a service solution that we have. but. We're, we are still working on that, but, but you have my commitment that we are going to share that when we can't get to it. Okay. And that information is, is so we're using one set of origin and destination, but the concessionaires, the proposers that we'll be proposing will actually be using their own calculations as to what where they believe it's coming from. So it, it's right now, I mean, in fact, even farther down the line, there will not be just a set of agreed to origin and destination figures because each developer will be using their estimations and they will put their special juice into their calculation. So just so you understand, there there will not just be a set of O&D uh, figures that, that everyone will use. Is there some level of scrutiny to make sure that the what the contractors are doing is appropriate if it's a differing set from what you're using they will use that for their designs and their investments right so again with zero state funds invested the decisions that are being made are at their risk so it's there's We'll, we'll agree to disagree on that and the, the final question that I have related to uh, to the the beltway is um, so it's been mentioned before by a couple other folks that some of the the companies that are being discussed obviously we don't know the full list of, of bidders um, or folks that are even working towards the process at this point um, have not had a great track record and some certainly have actually been involved in projects that have declared bankruptcy and I'm curious if you can commit tonight uh, to not select a company that has had a bankruptcy related to a similar P3 project in another part of the state or another part of the country. Yeah, I, I could that they wouldn't have gone bankrupt in another part of the state, but country. <laughs> no, these are all, well, in fact, I probably could because these firms all form joint ventures. And so no one joint venture is the same as the next. And so, but the reality is, is that all of these international firms invest in various in various projects around the world, and when when it does not work, um, and and a bankruptcy is declared, what's lost is the equity that's been invested, meaning the developers' equity that's been put at risk. The bondholders step up and take over the project, continue to operate it according to the to the contract that that the developer had with the state, and so. The users of the system 
have, there's been three that I'm aware of in the United States that have declared bankruptcy. The users of the system and the state uh, in all three situations never saw a, a penny of loss and the users never saw any disruption to their to the services they were they were using. Mr. Secretary, can you just concede that we actually need to look at the consortium members and not the shell company that the consortium uh, goes by when we're scrutinizing these kinds of contracts? We will be looking at the qualifications of the team members in all of those situations. But Thank you. I, that, that's exactly what I'm asking, the but, team members, not the yes. entity that they create. So they will, when we, when we release a request for qualifications, um, there will be a number of factors that they will have to submit to in order to be shortlisted. And um, we obviously are looking for financially sound uh, members to proceed uh, in the proposal submission for, for ours, assuming we are able to get through a NEPA process. Thank you. Your quick response to my colleague gave the impression that perhaps you were not going to be looking at the team members and how they participated in other P3s. So I just wanted to make very clear that we're going to be looking at the team members and their records in other yes. P3s and other projects. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, that is a yes or no. Uh, that's not a yes or no. Because, no, because uh, team members, just because they have been involved in one project. Uh, I didn't went, say you had to ban them from the project. I asked if you'd be bankrupt. scrutinizing their work so in other. Of course, of course we will do that. So, yes. Yeah, we will be looking at the Great. team members. Thank but you, Secretary. We will not Delegate Salma, I apologize for uh, interrupting your discourse. You, you beat me to it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I committed to being brief, so I um, want to just add my remarks echoing my colleague. Uh, my name is Emily Shetty. I'm a District 18 delegate. Our community um, borders a lot of 495, and so the concerns that have been raised by all of the Montgomery County elected officials about the expansion and privatization of 495 and 270 um, is, is something we hear constantly from our community members, so we please urge you to to take heed and listen to the concerns and keep uh, Montgomery County at the table as you consider uh, the movement going forward. I want to also just thank our MVA um, for the wonderful work you're doing on Real ID. Um, it has been um, something that a lot of our constituents have reported back that it's been a very expeditious process. And um, in addition to 495 being a big concern, we also have a lot of arterial roads in our district. So I want to thank um, your, uh, your team members for your uh, constant partnership with us on constituent service and on joining us for community meetings like the one we'll be having tomorrow night on Connecticut and Saul. Thank you. Thank you for the record, Delegate Vaughn Stewart, District 19. Uh, again, to echo what everyone has said, welcome to Montgomery County. Thanks again for making it out. I just have um, a couple of micro comments and then one larger macro comment to make, but it won't be very long. Um, one, I would just want to echo what my colleague, Delegate Solomon, said about the um, intersection between uh, Lay Hill Road Randolph in Georgia. Actually, the three people on in the panel right now, uh, including myself, um, despite being in diff different districts, we all visited um, that site for a uh, memorial service for one of my constituents who was hit by a car and who, who died um, a few months ago. And I, I think I can probably speak for all three of us that it's one of the more, more gut-riching experiences you can, you can have as an elected official to look someone's parents in the eye and tell them that you'll try to do a better job of making sure that both the administration as we and legislators do a better job of designing our roads so that they're consistent with how people use them and so that they're consistent with, the, with what I'm sure we all believe, which is that no one should lose their life just because they're trying to, to travel with their feet uh, for transportation. So I really do hope that you'll take seriously Delegate Solomon's comments and I hope you'll take that study seriously because, um, you know, speaking as someone who represents both Aspen Hill and Glenmont, those two areas have been absolute epicenters for a rash of pedestrian deaths that we've been having and it's really important that we get um, some solutions as soon as possible. And so, I, I, Administrator Slater, I really appreciate your comments, and I hope that, that you'll put that you know, on the top of your, of your list of, of what to look at. Yes, very good. Just to share with you, my, my team and I have been working with uh, uh, Sir Craig Wilson and the developers, and we currently have that whole particular area under review right now. And we're hoping to uh, actually meet back with the group and share the findings from that, really, 
And I think there are some things from an interim perspective that we can probably do to help. But certainly we are looking at it right now, actually, as I speak. Great. Okay. And I'm aware that the, the Action Committee for Transit, which is a local you know, transit and pedestrian safety group here in Montgomery County, has, has released its own sort of set of recommendations based on its own study of the area. And I don't know if you guys have received one, that, but I'm happy to one, send that over to you. I have not seen that. I'd be okay. happy to okay. take a look one, at it. One of the issues is the, the shopping center mm -hmm. that adds or that creates a lot of the mm -hmm. issue that exists up there right and the actual developer has ideas and, and so forth so we constantly going to be uh reviewing and meeting with them and we're going to try to see what we can do to at least provide some type of with some type of help enhancements really Okay. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Sure, and, and on a briefer, more related note, and I was actually exchanging an email with some of your staff today, Administrator Slater, about this issue. But in May, we had a student in Montgomery County hit by a car um, in between Magruder High School and um, Redland Middle School on Muncaster Mill Road in Durwood. And uh, there's been a lot of a uh, lot of constituents that have reached out to us in District 19 about uh, putting a sidewalk between those two schools, um, which are less than a mile apart, and which seems like you know, is a very, very obvious natural place that students want to travel between. Um, and it appears that there was the issue was studied in 2015. There may have been some ecological sort of environmental concerns about why a sidewalk was not put in. But I was informed actually this morning by your staff that, that you guys are going to take another look at it, which I really, really appreciate. And I just wanted to put that on all of your radar as well because that's. Uh, you know, we always obviously talk a lot about safe routes to schools, but when you're talking about two schools like that, a middle school and a high school, they're in such close proximity with so many siblings attending the respective schools. Um, we hope you guys will give that another uh, look and maybe an old college try about, about doing something in that area as well. Absolutely. I'll add that the team also did share with me that, that they were looking at that and wanted to circle back with me when they were done. So it was Great. something that they put on my radar as well. Great. Thank you very much. And then my macro comment, Secretary Ron, this will be a fun one for you. So, um, so you know, everyone obviously has seen that in the last year the, the IPCC has released its report that we need to make fundamental far-reaching changes in how we, how we basically do business in America and in the entire world if we want to combat the worst impacts of climate change. And as you also know that in Maryland, transportation is the number one uh, sector in terms of generator for greenhouse gas emissions. So I, my question is, is actually another one that, believe it or not, I get maybe even more from constituents than all of these micro issues, which is um, – what is what is your department doing in terms of how it analyzes when it puts together a document like the CTP and also when it decides on which road or transit projects it's going to prioritize, what impact, if any, um, does uh, the climate crisis have? So I would, and I would add, I have the same concerns about, you know, climate change and I worry about my children and grandchildren and the world they're going to, to have. Um, so we are a leader within TCI, which is the Transportation Climate Initiative uh, that's being led by Georgetown uh, Law Center. And uh, my deputy is one of the co-chairs of the TCI effort, and we are very involved in that uh, as far as trying to find ways to reduce carbon emissions coming from transportation. Uh, we do, in fact, consider uh, emissions. We have to stay within the budget of, uh, of uh, environmental levels that are presented to us by, uh, by EPA and therefore COG, and every single project has to fit within that budget. We do that. We look for ways that we can conduct our business in such a way that we can reduce those emissions ourselves. We are actively placing solar uh, panels where we can. Uh, we are exploring how we can uh, expand the use of hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, we are investing significant money, particularly working with the VW settlement money to expand the availability of charging stations. So this is something we're, we're all working on and we recognize the issues that we need to be involved in, and we're promoting. Thank you for that. And just one follow-up. One thing I didn't hear, and that is an impressive list, and certainly and, you know, we're all grateful that, that you and the governor do take climate change as a serious threat and not you know, a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese government or whatever. Um, but 
my follow-up question is one thing I did not hear is modal share. Um, you know, do, does the department endeavor at all to try to promote transit use? Does the, 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 are there any efforts or any conversations that go into sort of these the macro decisions that you guys make about trying to get people out of their cars and into a, onto a bicycle or using their feet or using transit for transportation? So commuter choice, I'm not sure if you were here when I had my opening remarks, but is a program that we are pushing heavily, which is to do just what you have said, and that is to – uh, to get people to choose other uh, modes of transportation. And we are, and I, I can read the list if you wanted to what we are attempting to get people to do, but it's all those various modes, even including teleworking. Uh, and it, it's, we're, we're pushing all of these things. The fact is that, you know, that automobile use still is the preferred method of transportation for the state. Uh, and in fact, for our country, and I, I think the um, the ultimate solution there is going to be the the fuel that you know what what is going to be the method of propulsion of these vehicles, and is it going to be electric? Is it going to be uh, fuel cells? What is it going to be? And I, I think that's going to really drive. Uh, I, it's going to drive. I think achievement of our energy policy as a country, uh, but <laughs> it opens up an entirely different issue, and that is how are we supposed to fund transportation? Because currently, we we have a national transportation policy in conflict with a national energy policy. That's something that we that legislators as well as the country is going to have to address over time. Okay. Thanks very much. We just opened the door to talking about revenues, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let's bring up Delegate Charcutian, Delegate Wilkins, and Delegate Moon from District 20. There's one more panel after that for the benefit of you and your team, Mr. Secretary. Right, you go first. Um, good evening, Delegate Charcutian, District 20. Um, you can use my pen. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for staying late. I know you're doing this all around the state, and we appreciate it, the opportunity to participate in the process. Um, I'll try not to repeat what's been said about the beltway widening, but I um, do want to sort of echo all the concerns that have been raised. And I just want to add that um, on, the, on the point about climate change, I think that any of the studies that have indicated that somehow throwing more asphalt down will result in um, less carbon dioxide emissions and, and less greenhouse gas emissions are flawed in a number of ways, and I don't necessarily want to have that whole conversation now, but I think that, among other things, they're flawed in assuming that the only way to address congestion is by putting more cars on the road. But it also, I think they're, um, they have other flaws, and I just I, that, ha that concept has not yet been, been stated, I don't think, so I just feel like, for the record, that needs to be, to be challenged as well. Um, I, I also um, I also just want to mention equity, which I think has sort of been said, but but the idea of moving people who have money faster than people who don't have money, when we already have people with, who have money moving faster in their cars than people who don't have money are using transit, um, is a significant concern, and um, and so this. Um, beltway widening project really adds to that, in addition to taking a lot of homes and parks and community facilities in our district. So um, mostly I'm saying me too, but I think for the record, those are other really important pieces to be considered. Um, as it relates to um, uh, pedestrian safety, which is the other area that I want to talk about, and administra administer administrator, it's late, it's later. Greg, how are you? <laughs> it's, uh, it is, I just want to say I want to thank you for your leadership on um, generally highlighting pedestrian safety and looking at roads differently and looking at state roads in a way that considers um, complete streets and multi multimodal transportation. Um, I think you personally have been very accessible to me and to our team when we've had concerns uh, around Montgomery Hills and others, so I want to thank you for that. I do want to say that we've been really disappointed, and I'm hoping that we're turning a corner based on conversations that we've been having recently, but we have been very disappointed with follow through um, on a number of, of areas. Our team has, has met and has worked on identifying places where sometimes very simple things like a crosswalk or even paint where a crosswalk was and now isn't um, ought to be put in and in other places more complex things where, or, or other simple things like, like hawk signals, but other places more complex things that require more engineering. And we've waited 
um, seven, eight, nine months to have um, answers on those. Um, and frankly, I actually did have a question. I was wondering if it's illegal if we were to go out and paint um, the crosswalk ourselves. Is that? I mean, we're actually curious. I'm not just trying to be a smart ass. I, um, we've wondered if it would actually take us less time to get the paint and go do it ourselves than the amount of time that we've spent trying to get, get it yes. done. It is illegal. Yes, okay. it would be. All right. Yes. I bet we would be heroes, though, if we went to jail in our district for doing that in some of these crosswalk areas. Um, so, uh, so I'm hoping that we're turning a corner on that. Um, and I just I want to I want to highlight the pedestrian safety piece uh, a little bit more and, and, and broaden it more contextually to talk about the Purple Line. So I want to begin by saying that um, I'm a huge supporter of the Purple Line. I think it's a really crucial investment that we're making. I think we need to invest in more transit. Um, and at the same time, while the Purple Line is being built, we have to pay a, a special attention to the communities along the Purple Line, and they have to keep being able to function. Um, uh, so there's a number of issues that, that we've, we've had uh, multiple conversations about in terms of the impact on those communities, businesses, and residents. But in particular, I want to talk about pedestrian safety along the Purple Line, because the Purple Line goes along roads that were already um, horribly dangerous for pedestrians, and those include University Boulevard, which has been talked about. There's parts of Wayne Avenue, sections of Long Branch, um, and the, the situation has um, just gotten uh, worse with the Purple Line construction. And I think folks know uh, probably that Mr. Vargas was crossing the street and was killed uh, two days, uh, t two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, to, to Delegate Stewart's point earlier, um, those tragedies sort of um, should be giving us all pause. Um, but these are issues that we have known about and we have been talking about, and so it's all the more sort of um, the uh, it's all the more horrible than when when someone someone is killed. Um, and I and I guess my question is, and what I'm interested the conversation I'm interested in having is is related to whether or not the, there is a comprehensive pedestrian safety plan around Purple Line construction, and if there isn't, how quickly one can be put together. Um, and so I just would highlight it. Sometimes it's, um, it's things like often we have um, sidewalks on both sides of the street are closed at the exact same time, and so there's literally no place for folks to go. Um, and so children are you know, walking in the street competing with drivers who are already frustrated um, in uh, already frustrated because of the the slowed down traffic. Um, there's places where there again already there were there were no crosswalks for maybe a full three quarters of a mile, and then uh, when the median strip is taken out, which was a pedestrian refuge, and that's the place that Mr. Vargas was killed, that was the issue. Um, now it's worse. We have. Um, uh, so I, I won't go through through all of the issues, but I think the, the bottom line is that when it comes to Purple Line construction, part of what is happening is that because there's so many agencies involved, it's on a state highway, Purple Line partners involved, MTA, uh, MDOT is involved, the county sometimes is involved, and so when there's an issue, every agency sort of points to somebody else, um, and so we're left calling multiple people trying to figure out why two sidewalks are closed, and by the time we find out the right person to talk to about it, um, they've been closed for two days and children have been walking in the street. Um, and so I think that's where there's need for this sort of comprehensive plan every, uh, like a, uh, as, as quickly as possible because, um, you know, frankly, when people get hit by a car, they don't care which agency was responsible. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just, before we lose more lives on, you know, it, it, on this quarter, um, we need a plan. And I know we're starting to talk about that, but I want to sort of ask everybody tonight to make that commitment to do the multi-agency effort that's necessary um, for that safety. Uh, I'll start first. Let me say that, that after you and I spoke, I think, was it Friday, Thursday, something along that line, but uh, uh, I, I've asked the team to get me a copy of the, the, the traffic construction plan as part of that partnership so that we can understand. And I know Andre and his team have been working very closely uh, with some. Uh, we were actually just discussing uh, some of the elements prior to this meeting. We are gonna lower the speed limit on 193 during construction. We're gonna lower that down to 30 miles an hour uh, just to try and get some immediate uh, relief there. And then uh, you and I are, I believe we're gonna go walk that whole corridor so uh, we can kind of walk through Well, that. I think we're walking the entire Purple Line corridor. We were <laughs> just gonna right. do. <laughs> just 193. <laughs> but but absolutely, we're, we're really taking a hard look at that. You know, one of our, 
one of the pieces to our context guide that we have not gotten to yet is is kind of what I'll call that next phase, and it's how we're dealing with pedestrian maintenance of traffic in some of these uh, central business districts and urbanized areas. Most of the time, what I've found is you know, private developers, for instance, will really do what you what you ask. It's just we have to ask, and we have to have the right guidance in place for the right treatment and the right. Uh, community so that's kind of the next phase of this but but we do hear you on the purple line and, and we hear many others as well thanks hi good yeah. evening delegate Janelle Wilkins thank you again for being here and to the entire team for your presentations and all of yours your service throughout Maryland um, I wanted to actually start off by reading to you all very briefly um, a text from one of my constituents, one of our mutual constituents. Um, 9.15 p.m. Wednesday, October 16, 2019. Construction started with explosive drop of sheet metal. They're digging up again what they dug up and filled in on the same spot in the corner of Spring in US 29, right under our front window. They kept us sleepless last night, elevating both my and my wife's blood pressure. And now they'll ruin another night. The worst thing about this is that we and our neighbors feel absolutely powerless to hide from these repeated assaults. Nighttime construction from, from SHA and also the Purple Line partners. In this particular instance, we have contacted, um, our contact at SHA several times with concerns around this nighttime construction that's keeping our constituents up at night. Um, I think our constituents have been very patient around various construction that's happening throughout the district. Um, but the repeated nighttime construction, I think, is, is a bit unreasonable. So I would just like to raise that and ask you all to respond around what you all can do. I understand you have sort of unbridled authority around nighttime construction. Um, but what you all can do to really ensure that our constituents are not repeatedly um, kept up at night. So, uh, you know, it is, it's one of these balances that we are having to deal with given the amount of traffic within the region, and that is if we have construction during the day, it makes it even worse for those people who are trying to get to work, and when we do it during the night, we impact people's, you know, home environments, and it's that trade-off that we constantly have, and when we when we think we can stand construction during the day we do it but quite honestly given the volume of traffic within the region the windows for us to do that are so small that we are end up we end up being forced into night construction and when we do that the contractors need some you know, they need x number of hours to get a job done and unfortunately that extends into sleep hours for the residents and we know we know it's disruptive we typically when we know that's going to happen we have i know on the purple line uh we have offered people to stay in hotels and we'll pay for the hotel when we know it's going to be particularly disruptive but I, I'm not familiar with the intersection that you're referring to on 129, so I don't know if that's an SHA project or if that's a a, the, a purple line. SHA. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we are aware of that. And what you have on US 29, we have a state operation and you have a WSSC. And basically, they was making what I feel or believe was most of the noise, and we're trying to work with them to the point that what we have done in the past, we have tried to work with them to the point that we're going to identify the noisiest part of construction and try to use that during the day and try to make sure that the night is not the, the noisiest part of the actual construction, as in jackhammer and so forth like that. So we're constantly trying to work with them and find a way to way that we can ultimately be less impactful, really. Okay. Thank you. I will follow up once again with your offices. This sure. particular event was until 4:15 a.m. in the morning, so it's it's just really not reasonable. Um, I agree. Thank I agree. you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move over with a, a question for the MVA, and then and then come back to um, Rhodes. Um, 
thank you so much for your responsiveness to my office every time we reach out with an issue. Very much appreciate it. I wanted to ask about, I read in the news that the Trump administration has requested um, data from local um, departments of motor vehicle. And I wanted to ask if we, if Maryland has received that request for data and also if when it confirmed that we will not be sharing that information. Uh, yes, I can confirm that we did receive that data and uh, we just responded that no, we would not be providing personal information. Uh, we did offer to provide quantitative information, so if they wanted to know, you know numbers of people in a certain zip code, if that would be helpful to make sure that we've gotten, we've counted all people for census purposes, we'd provide that, but no personal information would be provided. Okay, so given the nature federally of, of what is what has been happening and around the request for data, especially around citizenship information, I would still be concerned and curious about the specific quantitative data. So, so um, we don't have citizenship providing. data, and we specifically, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, mm -hmm. we told them that we do not have citizenship data, and so that's not something we could provide anyway. Okay, so can you share more about the specific data? You said that there is data that you shared. You said we did form. not share any data. We just responded to okay. them and said we could not provide any personal information. That means name, that means address, including zip code, date of birth, um, any personal information like that that we collect, we would not be providing. Um, if it was helpful to them, um, to make sure that we've accounted for all Marylanders to provide quantitative data. So that would mean, you know, in this zip code, we have this number of individuals with either a driver's license or ID card. That's all it would say. Um, no personal information, again, would be provided. Okay. Does that Thank make you. sense? Yes, that makes sense. Um, all right. Quickly, um, wanted to, I'll just flag two issues would really love your partnership and support when it comes to the purple line and the communities and also the businesses that will be impacted so for example our businesses on new hampshire avenue in in district 20 our businesses on bonifant um who are small mom and pop micro businesses and i understand the state has put forward a lot of resources around the purple line but we really i think it would be a failure of us to have a successful purple line bill but we lose our businesses that are impacted during construction. So we'd really appreciate your support and partnership around legislation that we've introduced to help offset some of the cost um, for, these, for these businesses and in our communities and just really welcome your partnership on that. Um, the final thing that I will, will flag is just echoing the um, the concern and the urgency around Montgomery Hills. We appreciate the prioritization and would really like to see um, us move forward quickly and urgently around um, obtaining the rest of the funds and moving forward with that effort. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, folks. Delegate David Moon. <clears throat> um, I don't want to duplicate anything my colleagues said. I agree with um, all of their sentiments. I'll just raise a couple quick points. The first is I just want to remind uh, you of the conversation we had right before the election where we got the governor's word that there would be no homes and businesses taken for any of the highway widening. And so I look forward to uh, um, sticking uh, the administration to their word uh, in the coming years. And two, to the extent that you're u utilizing cashless tolls for your system, I just want to continue to flag that you're, if you do not do something different than how we use the current cashless tolls, you're going to end up sending thousands and thousands of appeals to uh, Montgomery County's district courts um, and other courts throughout the state. It's a three-year wait right now to appeal a toll. And so you've got to force a different system um, as you proceed with your planning. Um, lastly, I do want to uh, reiterate the pedestrian safety issue, but to be quite a bit more specific, and that is if you were to go through state highways throughout District 20, you would notice a common feature and that most of them do not have medians or pedestrian crossings, um, especially in key places like the downtown areas. In our prior meetings with uh, SHA reps when we flagged some of these issues, a conversation always tends to go like this. If it's something small like restriping, we can do that within existing resources. But these other things you're talking about require a larger approval and more resources. So consider this yet one more request to have resources for pedestrian safety put into 
very specific devices like um, pedestrian crossings and medians. Um, we have a lot of busy urban areas where we have six lane highways running through them and we have school bus cameras documenting thousands of violations at the bus stops at the, in those uh, downtown areas. So we need some help. Thank you. Great. Thank you, delegates. Let's bring up our final panel, our very patient municipal officials, Mayor Bridget Newton from Rockville, Councilman Mark Pichella from Rockville, Gaithersburg uh, Mayor Judd Ashman, Gaithersburg Councilmember Lori Ann Sales. And just for your benefit, Mr. Secretary, these folks have an election tomorrow, and they're spending Election Eve uh, with you. So I hope you'll give them your attention. Mayor, why don't you go ahead and get started? Sure. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, appreciate the late hour and your attention to uh, our county and especially the city of Rockville and Gaithersburg. Um, I speak for all of the mayor and council and most of our citizens. We do not support any widening of I-270 beyond the existing right away. There are other ways to take care of our terrible congestion in this area. Uh, this is 2019, almost 2020. Puzzles me that the state of Maryland would think that the Purple Line is the only transit alternative that should be being considered in Montgomery County. Um, we have others that need it just as much. We are a county of over a million people. I'm sure the census will prove me right. And uh, we need more transit, not less. Um, many of us could have foreseen the lessening in revenue from the gas tax. Finding new sources that are sustainable and equitable is a goal that we should all share together. I've suggested to the Maryland Municipal League that the Maryland Municipal League work with MACO and our other stakeholders and put together a work group to study and come up with equitable, equitable solutions that fund the transportation trust fund into the future so that we can do what we need to do in the state of Maryland. Um, the CCT, please return it to the CTP. Transit Opportunity is a tool for economic redevelopment along Shady Grove Road um, and will help with Gaithersburg, the city of Rockville, and all of Montgomery County. Toll roads are regressive. All you have to do is look at Texas, Illinois, Indiana, and the state of Virginia to see what happens when toll roads fail. Mr. Secretary, no disrespect intended, but it doesn't not fall on the taxpayers. Eventually it does. When those roads are returned to the state, we are left with a big, big problem. And finally, this is an opportunity for MDOT and SHA to think big to be bold in your responses to the problems that we are facing with climate change, pedestrian safety, and equity. I urge you to please think big. Help us in Montgomery County, the city of Rockville, do the best we can be. Thank you. For the record, Judd Ashman, Mayor Gaithersburg. A um, few quick points. Uh, first off, thank you all for being here, um, and nice, nice to see our uh, Senator, our, our delegation here. Um, we appreciate the investment the state's making in our community with the Watkins Mill interchange. It's, it's an enormous deal for our city, and I think the headline I got from this evening was actually one word from Greg Slater, which was summer, because we, we anticipated the opening would be fall of 2020, but apparently it's summer of 2020. Makes us very happy. Um, we, uh, we also, as uh, Delegate Polakovich Carr mentioned, and uh, as we've had discussions many times with, with Greg Slater at this point, uh, we appreciate your commitment to uh, reevaluating the long delayed Clopper Road, Maryland 117 project, particularly in the context of the opening of the new interchange, which is going to come out on one side onto that, that very road. Um, it is very, very important. I really can't overstate the value of uh, looking at it very carefully and, and um, making improvements uh, concurrent with the opening of the interchange. Um, I will add our city's voice to the disappointment about the elimination of a quarter of the city's transit way from the draft CTP. Um, I'll make it, I'll take a slightly different tack and, and say, um, in addition to all the, the, the good and valid points about uh, transit and transportation, um, I'll note that there is a ton of economic development that is tied to that plan, uh, density, um, thousands of jobs in one of the most vibrant uh, biotech indus industrial sectors, clusters in the country. Um, so uh, I will, I'll, on behalf of the city, I'll, I'll join our voice to those who say, please add it back to the CTP. 
Um, we are looking forward to the completion of the bicycle pedestrian path that's going around uh, NIST uh, along Quince Orchard Road in the coming year. Um, and finally, we appreciate uh, uh, being a, a partnering agency for the I-270 P3 study as it gets up uh, uh, north of 370, and we look forward to the completion of the pre-NEPA development stage for uh, development al alternatives for evaluation. So thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. I want to appreciate, uh, appreciate um, the uh, delegation and the county council, county executive, and the municipalities for coming out and asking some uh, good questions. And I want to thank the administration for your time uh, this evening. Uh, I know it was a late night, but very important for everyone to have a voice and be heard. And uh, we want to wish everyone a good night tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And everyone, be, com be careful going home. It's, a, it's an enterprise. Bradley Hills Village, we describe ourselves as an intergenerational uh, neighborhood-based organization of neighbors helping neighbors. We serve five distinct subdivisions in the Bethesda area. And Bradley Hills Village is a community of neighbors helping neighbors. It's an intergenerational community that helps others with social, educational, and recreational